um, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, but first, before we get started, I, I just want to say, um, I think I speak for the council when I say that we are all just so saddened um, and heartbroken even really um, over the death of uh, Mark Johnson. And we just want to recognize, um, you know, that that is just so painful. And, you know, he knew a lot of people in the community. and. Um, I, I want you also to know that, so I was in, invited to um, uh, take a, by one of the residents of the Pioneer Street Apartments to um, take a tour uh, of that building and meet some of the residents there. And I just want to extend an invitation to the council. If you want to come um, with me on that, just let me know. Um, love to have you along. Um, so I also just want to say that we as a council are not in a position to speculate as to whether or not that was, uh, the, the, the police action was justified or not. Um, but I do want everybody to know that we are, as a city, committed to a full and rigorous um, investigation that's being done currently by the state police. Um, I know there are some people here who um, have a lot of thoughts about and feelings about this and would like to share that. Um, so as we go into general business and appearances, if there's anybody who specifically who wants to talk about that incident, um, that would let's let's do that first, I think. And uh, so and just so you know how this is going to go, we'd love to um, hear your thoughts and feelings and questions. Um, and then just so you're aware, our police chief is not um, he's not uh, around today. Um, so we're going to be collecting your your thoughts and questions and um, uh, and then uh, probably having an item on the agenda um, sometime in the future uh, to uh, to talk about those those things so um, Lawrence I know you wanted to go so <coughs> welcome okay. thank you uh, madam mayor and uh, council for having me here uh, my name is Lawrence Seiler I'm a huge advocate. Uh, my wife and I are huge advocates in the field of special needs uh, with a television show called Special People, I mean, sorry, Abled and On Air, uh, which is on um, Orca Media. Uh, but uh, just to say that I live at Pioneer Apartments, and so does my wife. And even though I, we did not know Mr. Johnson completely well, uh, he was uh, nice to us and uh, you know, a timid man, uh, he didn't like crowds, etc. cetera. Um, but um, what needs to happen, in my opinion, is that there needs to be more crisis intervention uh, with uh, Montpelier Police Department. And just a thought um, that if you guys on the council can make it a ruling that all my or anybody that wants to work for the Montpelier Police or the, the state, uh, as far as the police, should mandatorily get training, either through Washington County, uh, NAMI, Vermont, or any of those organizations that offer this training. This should not have happened. There, um, According to some people from Washington County that I have spoken to, who have been on my show numerous times, De-escalation does not take, a court, uh, the police have spoken to Mr. Johnson to try, to, they, he was on the Spring Street Bridge and then pointed the gun at the police. But de-escalation does not take five minutes. It takes longer than that. Counseling somebody takes longer than that. So there needs to be more de-escalation techniques. Thank you. You're welcome. Particularly, I, I also just want to note that I neglected to do to uh, review the, and approve the agenda. Um, we'll do that after, <laughs> I suppose. So, any any further comments, particularly um, on this incident? Else will say, I'll lower Zach Hughes, um, Prospect Neighborhood. Um, so I come here tonight. Um, 
I, um, too, uh, struggled with Mr. Johnson's death. In addition, a friend of mine uh, died over the weekend as well. So it's been a tough weekend, yeah, last weekend. Um, but it was interesting. I was asked by someone on the street. They seem to think I can fix things. So they said to me, uh, what am I going to do about this? And um, I, I said I would uh, give it some thought and come in with some suggestions. Nothing here tonight. But what I will say is that I will be part of the effort to uh, try to learn from this incident and move forward. We have um, the one thing I will do tonight, and may not give me brownie points, and I'm not looking for it, um, is I'm going to say that I am in, I continue to have full confidence in the Montpelier Police Department and their personnel. It was not an easy situation on Friday, I'm sure. And I want to say what we already have in place, from what I understand, we do have crisis intervention. We continue to have that in Washington County. It's known as Team 2. They're working on it. And it was just in the newspaper the other day. Um, so she said, this is not going to be an easy thing. Um, and I um, will continue to uh, educate people. And uh, of course, come on Lawrence's show which I have done a series of interviews. And um, so I um, give my condolences to Mr. Johnson and his family. And I also give my support to the Montpelier Police Department and all personnel involved that morning. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to? Uh, discuss this particular topic. Yeah. Good evening. I have some thoughts that I wrote. You gotta get right on that mic. If you would say your name for us. Yes. I'm Peter Harris. I live on East State Street. Thank you. Um, I'm alarmed by two police homicides in as many years, and I'm wondering about the direction of the peaceable backwater that I have called home for three decades. I understand Mr. Johnson had no history of violence, yet was shot with a long gun from a distance. It will be particularly cruel if we find out that Mr. Johnson was actually trying to get into his own apartment. Corrective action as to police procedures and protocols should flow from this death, even if the policeman is exonerated. Thank you. Thank you. Other thoughts on this particular topic? Uh, Stephen Whitaker. Stephen Whitaker. Uh, I second Zach's comments. I do have faith in our police department, and yet I, that leaves room for mistakes to have been made. Um, the de escalation, the compressed time period, the use of a long gun. There's a whole lot of th questions that arise. Uh, training and technique and protocol for inviting more experienced mental health uh, counseling in is essential. Um, I have told people for decades that I live in Montpelier because we don't have these kinds of shootings here and it's tragic that we're joining the ranks of national uh, without prejudging whether this was uh, this could have been avoided uh, in my informed opinion I've circulated and make available some more copies of the a photo of uh, Mark he's one of ten children from Vermont and 
Um, there's only one left, you know. Uh, but these are available if people want them. Um, is this your only non-agenda item? Nope. Slot? So I was going to okay. shift. So and then if, if you have other things to say, I'll we'll have a, a separate time for that too. So, cool. so I would encourage I, I would encourage the city council to take whatever action is possible. I filed a public records request. I know some media organizations have uh, to release information as soon as possible, specifically cruiser cam, schematic, etc. This may be a storm, and it may take some time to pass, but the sooner we get started, the later. If, if it looks as if we're going to, the better. I mean, if it looks as though we're, it's going to take six months or a year, uh, that's going to not be good. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Parker, Hillside Avenue. Um, I think one of the reasons I live in Montpelier is because there's a deep sense of caring that we all have for each other. And I uh, wanted to say that I was very impressed that on Saturday I saw two police officers who I've never seen knowingly at the market, walking through the market. I, as I remind everybody, I'm car liberated, so I walk everywhere. And as a consequence, I know everyone downtown. You just, it's so small, you get to know people. And I, um, I love our police department. I think that they uh, do so many things so well. And my one thing is I encourage them to walk more so that they really get to know everybody. Because if they had been, downtown and they would have known this man who was so vulnerable and so sweet and um, things would might have gone differently so that's my one suggestion thank you thank you anyone else on this topic okay well thank you all for um, for your thoughts, um, does any, any counselors want to comment on this particularly? If not, that's fine. Um, okay. Um, any uh, besides this topic, any other general business and appearances um, uh, issues? Now would be an okay time, Stephen. Uh, again, Stephen Whitaker. I'd like to read into the record. There was an incident uh, a few days ago. Uh, up on the trail between from Memorial Drive and Main Street, or uh, Northfield Street, headed up. Uh, two old buddies who went to high school here uh, with Bob Watson, et cetera. Uh, one now lives in Vietnam, the other lives in British Columbia. They came here, they decided to go have a beer up on the trail, and they were accosted by four police officers. Uh, they were you know, flashlights prepared as clubs, computer uh, data terminals to run their license, et cetera. Uh, I asked for the records. Um, I got the reports. The reports reflected no, you know, burglar on the loose, uh, suspects resembled, anything like that. Uh, this was basically something that needs the attention. I'm going to read into the record the response I got from one of those people. Uh, Steve, thank you for your thoughtful email. The conduct of the MPD officers was indeed suspect and likely illegal. The cops had no probable cause to interrogate Bob and me and to demand that we show identification, which they then used to search their database for any excuse to place us in custody. They also lied to us. They claimed that we were, they were asked to inspect the area to investigate, quote, a loud disturbance, end quote. They also claimed that we were on private property, quote, owned by a woman who lives in California, end quote, who re, who's requested their help in, quote, keeping out vagrants, end quote, on her property. We now know, as Bob told me before, we went there to drink a beer that the property is owned by National Life. Bob should show up at the meeting tonight if he remains indignant at the cops' disruption of our otherwise wonderful reunion. I'm off to Vietnam for a few weeks to resume my volunteer teaching duties. 
and have little interest in fighting small town police misconduct. If the recent unwelcome intrusion by the cops somehow affects my pending departure, my attitude about this subject will change dramatically. Uh, I think y'all need to be very engaged with I just want to interject. I just got a, a, a note that there is no audio on the streaming. Oh. Okay, well, it, I'm not going to repeat myself. But I think I am raising the caution as I do regularly. I also discovered from talking to the homeless, some of the homeless folks, that a former officer who retired last year is making appearances in plain clothes with badge and gun. And it, on one of those appearances, he kicked the homeless people's money bucket. And I raised this, I think Chief Fankos is aware, and did ex laudably express concern that someone might be impersonating a Montpelier officer who no longer works here. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. OK. Oh, any other um, general business and appearances? An item otherwise not on our agenda. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I'm not used to the City Council. My name is Erica Rail. I'm representing the Vermont Center for Independent Living, as well as uh, people with disabilities, as well as myself. So many different hats tonight. Um, some of you know me. Um, so I'm actually here to talk about the homeless task force that's been talked about in the paper. So if if uh, the item that you want to talk about is on the agenda, um, then we will get there and you can talk about oh, it. Oh, I didn't know if I wanted to talk tonight. Uh, this open forum or not? Okay, so I can talk later. Yes. 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 Thank you. And so this time is for any, I should have specified, I'm sorry. Um, this is for uh, uh, ta talking, discussing any items that are otherwise not on our agenda. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no worries at all. Not it's all good. Your format. No worries. No. It's all good. Um, okay. Any, any other uh, discussion on items, otherwise not on our agenda? Okay. All right, so um, just reviewing and approving the agenda. Um, uh, I don't think there's any changes. I think there's going to be an amendment to the consent agenda, but we'll deal with that next. Um, otherwise, I don't think anything has been taken <coughs> off or adjusted. Am I correct about that, team? Okay, great. So we'll consider the agenda um, approved without objection. Um, so on to the consent agenda. Um, Jack. I'd like to take uh, item F off the consent agenda. Okay. Any other items? Okay. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Move it. Second. Oh, I'm, I'm assuming without item F. Um, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. So the consent agenda um, uh, is approved. And we're going to take up item F right now because uh, Michael is here. Um, so uh, I don't know if, John, you want to take this one or if um, we should be inviting someone up. What do you? Sure, well, I'll just mention real quick. And I apologize. I had put it down as an item for discussion. So I, I would not have tried to slip this one by because it involves a policy issue. The policy for vendors has been they have to be gone by 10 o'clock. So this is someone who came to me requesting to set up um, a, a vendor space to sell food 10 o'clock and later. So um, obviously it means both the spots out front are available and that's where he'd like to be. And uh, you know, I was like, well, I don't know, it's a policy decision, so come to the city council. <laughs> so that's, um, that's the genesis. Any questions from council? Thoughts? I love it. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to hear from the vendor to have a little more detail. Sure. Yeah. Hey, Michael Cantalupo, I'm from the Northfield. Keep real close to the mic. Uh, Michael Cantalupo from Northfield. Hi. Welcome. I like to serve food after 10 o'clock at night for all the patrons coming out of the bar so they can get something to eat instead of driving to McDonald's or anywhere else, sober up a little bit. Um, my thoughts were from like maybe Wednesday to Saturday nights from 10.30 to maybe 1, 1.30. Uh, I'm not going to use any generators so I won't disturb any of the apartments or people around. You know, just propane and the thing and alternate food each week so they keep coming by to get something different. And do you have, 
Do you have, do you have an estimate or any prediction of what kind of noise you would expect to be generating? None really. <laughs> I mean, it's just running propane. Uh huh. Um, conversation between yeah, the conversation customers. between people. Uh, maybe them sitting there eating. Uh, it's no won't be no more than them staying outside of Charlie O's, having cigarettes and talking on the side of the street. And Charlie O's is open until two. two. So two. this would even be. Before I, I would. I, well, I'd probably close down around one thirty, okay. quarter or two. Okay. It depends. I mean, if someone was drunk and wanted to eat, I'd serve them. Um, I do have a question also. Um, John, these permits are a year. Uh, like, uh, well, you they, would have to reapply again next year? Or you'd, have to, you'd have to re I mean, they're not, they're for a year period, but it's like all the dog licenses, it closes up. So we'd have to reapply uh, by the end of next April. Um, okay. But it would go on. Okay. Yeah, and I, I'm presuming if you all went for it that I'd just charge in the standard vendor fee. Um, just a different time. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, maybe I just didn't hear you correctly. How many nights a week do you want to do uh, that? Wednesday to uh, Saturday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Friday, Saturday, yes. My, my pause is that we just have downtown housing right now that we've increased, and so I really want to give people a chance to give us some input on that. It's all just balancing that, people living right across the street. Okay. So would your proposal be that we not I, take I could set tonight? up in front of the courthouse where the other guy sets up during the day. It's not a problem. Out in front of the courthouse. I'm trying to think of it as that's further from housing. Yeah, um, that's, there's no housing over there. What do you think, Donna? What's the level of activity over there? <laughs> well, there's a bar on the side street. There's two bars on the side street over there, and then you get Chalio's, and then the other one. <laughs> So there's uh, one, two, three, plus three penny, four, right in that walking distance. You know, they got that club on the corner right there. Sweet by Yes. Yep. Um, right. If we, yeah. If we said yes tonight, are you ready to hit the ground running? Or are you like all I'm set up tonight. now? I was waiting for approval before I went sure. and got my insurance. So yeah. maybe like two, three weeks. Would you be? Uh, mm -hmm try to crack this nut here would you be if you wanted to try it at city hall and we got a lot of complaints would you be willing to move if we asked yeah, absolutely on, so sure so you're not locked into a location and then we can see how it works yeah i mean i i could even get permission to go in front of uh chalios too a little right on the side right there but that's not really one of our approved vendor spots. But <laughs> no. yeah. Over here's better. Oh, you mean you, well, you could probably get a permission? You'd have to get permission from the property owner in yeah. there. Yeah. They do that, and you're all good. So. That you're making people are there on Thursday, right. Friday. But in, at night? Um, as late as 10. Any o'clock? other co yeah. uh, comments from I was just council questions? Uh, Jack? I, I'm with Donna. I would feel more comfortable. Um, Putting this over to our next meeting, giving uh, people notice that this is going to be considered, so people in the neighborhood who want to be heard would like to would, would have the opportunity to do that. Other thoughts, uh, Glenn? Um, just since we're giving opinions, I think I am. I think I would rather. Uh, let him go ahead for now and see if we hear from folks. I feel like the likelihood of really loud disturbances is slight um, and feels like a, a friendly setup. And also the bars are, as we've already said, already open past when he's going to be open and people are already out on the street. I'm comfortable with the green light tonight, um, especially with Bill suggesting that you'd be amenable to moving if there are some noise complaints. Absolutely. Um, does anybody have a motion they want to make? I would move that we approve the permit request. Uh, and I don't know, John, are the hours spelled out on other permits? It's I under the... Yeah, under what we've got in the, the city, I think the hours are something like, I can't remember when they start, I think it's 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Okay. So that's what makes this work okay. special. So um, I do want to have like a cutoff. I was a bartender when I lived in Italy for a while, and 
you know, we were open to like nude <laughs> from the day before and reopened at one. Um, so I just want to make sure that there is like a cutoff time, like, and I don't, I think 6, 6 a.m. is way too long, but you know, I don't know if 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., no later than 3 a.m. So, so I wouldn't be able to do that late. No later than two. No late. I would say no later than two. Okay. Yeah. Second. Um. Wait. I'm sorry. Was there a second to that? Yeah. yeah. There was. Okay. Further discussion. Jack. How would you? I'll, I'll move that we um, to amend the motion to make it uh, <clears throat> for a one month period, or make it subject to. Uh, to review uh, during the uh, permit period so that uh, we can review it and, and terminate it or modify it uh, if problems develop. Does that already exist, though, in the authority that we have to issue? I would assume that there's got to be a revocation procedure, so why would this be any different? It's a license. Licenses can be pulled. Yeah, so I, I'm just, I'm curious why would why would this be any different than any other vendor permit if issues arose that violated? I don't know. What do our regulations say for pulling licenses? It's not specific, so it's really at the, it's going to be at your discretion. Um, there's I don't motions. believe. There's I have to double check that, but I don't think. Is there a second? Um, so the motion, uh, or the amendment uh, fails, but lack of second. Um, further discussion on the original motion? Um, okay, and you're open to feedback if you need to move, if you... Absolutely. Okay, all right. I just want to serve the bar community after the <laughs> restaurants close, you know, and I'm not going I'm, I'm to have high prices either. You know, it's like five bucks, six bucks, eight yeah. bucks. Okay. You know. um, for, any further discussion? All uh, right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great, thank you. So and I have to thank ask, you. are you by chance an insomniac? So you want to be out doing something? <laughs> Trying to get out of the restaurant business. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get out of the, the, the line cooking. So. Okay. Yeah, there you go. I hope it's a success and, and reasonable noise, okay? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank I wanted you to do an Italian that. deli in Montpellier, so right. I think it's yeah. going to something that's good business. Yeah, this is great. All right, thank you again. Um, so we are moving on to um, uh, some uh, appointments. Uh, so the first one is uh, to the Housing Trust Fund Committee. Um, I believe we have uh, a number of recommendations um, for that. Committee is to consist of five people appointed by the council, um, one member of the city council, uh, four people from Montpelier, uh, two members of the committee should be members of the housing task force, and two from the public at large. So um, I think we have, um, sorry, help me out here. <laughs> we had, so we had two people for each. Two people for each, okay. Uh, um, so Richard Amore and Amore and Rick DeAngelis for the members of the public. Mary oh, Hooper and Brian Evans is the housing task force rep. Right, right. Thank you. The council, Sorry. Which I think is caught up there. All right, so are any of those folks here would like to introduce themselves? Okay. Um, is there a motion? Oh, uh, I, we were going to do all of them. Do you want to do all of them at first and then we'll have an executive session? I don't know. I was, I was going to move to since we have the exact number of uh, nominations or applications as we do with vacancies, I was going to move to appoint the applicants. I'll second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you all for your work. All right, uh, on to the Planning Commission. So there we have one vacancy, and uh, Marcella Dent um, has uh, applied to be on it. And I think Marcella is here. Do you want to come introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Marcella Dent. Um, I've been in Montpelier for about two years now, and 
I work for the State uh, Agency of Natural Resources, and I'm also a master's student at the University of Vermont. And um, I'm just really excited to, um, for an opportunity to both apply what I've learned in school and what I'm learning um, in my beginning of my career here and in service of Montpelier. So thank you for your consideration. I really appreciate it. Any questions for Marcella? OK, great. Thank you. Um, shall we do the development? You've already done this one next. doesn't matter. Happy to um, Why don't we wait and we'll just do that yeah. mostly. All right, and so uh, for the uh, Development Review Board, uh, we have two vacancies and um, well, I think one applicant, Michael Lazarczyk, and I don't see Michael here, um, so he can't introduce himself. Uh, is there a motion regarding um, either or both of these, or do you want to go into executive session? I move we appoint uh, both of these applicants to the positions that we'll apply for. Second. For the discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Again, thank you for your work. Um, looking forward to working with you all. Okay. Uh, so now we have an update from the Energy Advisory Committee. And I know Kate is here, so welcome. So I'm Kate Stevenson. I'm the chair of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Um, and I was asked to come in and just give an update. We're shooting to give updates a couple times a year to the council. Um, so I submitted a couple of uh, bullet points just to give some idea of what we have been working on and what is coming up. Um, and I'll just run through those and then take any questions from the council if you want to know more. We'll see if I can answer them. Um, but we've been moving forward on, in terms of municipal projects with the revolving loan fund. Uh, we completed a number of projects over the, the winter spring, um, including LED lights in the City Hall Theater, uh, weather stripping City Hall windows, which was a big project, um, and then some work at the fire station on the district heat pipes and some controls. And uh, so our next project that we're working on for the revolving loan fund is looking at all the overhead doors. Turns out there are something like 18 different overhead doors if you count up all the buildings. And uh, a lot of them don't seal properly. So we um, have been working with Efficiency Vermont to do some blower door testing of those doors. And then we'll do insulation and weather stripping and come back and, and measure the energy savings. And if it's significant enough, we'll go ahead and do the same thing on the other doors as well over the next couple months. Um, in terms of the waste water, uh, water resource recovery facility, we're really trying to work on um, starting to plan for phase two, which is what do we do with the methane once we start producing it, uh, now that they're under construction over there on, on phase one. So um, just starting to crunch some numbers and look at what the possibilities could be for that um, energy that will be produced. Um, on the school front, we um, were able to meet with Andrew LaRosa, who's the new facilities director for the school district, and um, we'll also be going to one of the upcoming uh, school board meetings to talk about kind of how we, how we, as the Energy Advisory Committee, can collaborate with the school district on plans for how do we get our three schools to net zero in the next 10 years. So. Um, that's underway and have made some connections there with Efficiency Vermont. Um, we got good news about the, um, there have been some issues with the solar panels at the wastewater treatment facility. They haven't been working properly for the last couple of years, but sounds like they got fixed. So they're not, it's not a huge energy producer, but once they're on the roof, they might as well be working. So I'm glad to see that that's been repaired. Um, we are really looking forward to the hire of the new um, position, facilities director, energy, what I don't know what it's exactly it's going to be called, but uh, looking forward to it and um, want to help in whatever way we can with the hiring process. And uh, good news from police department was that um, over the winter, you know, they installed heat pumps um, to replace their aging cooling system. And we got the bills back, uh, electric bills back from May, June, July, and it basically cut the electric bill in half um, for those months, uh, the cooling months, so that was exciting. And we'll, we'll do some more analysis as we get more data back, but 
Uh, we weren't really involved with that project, but glad to help track the energy savings. Um, and then, you know, last time I was here, I think we were talking about the greenhouse gas emissions tracking and, and the new program software that we're using to do that. We haven't done a whole lot since, since that May presentation, but um, the next step is really getting all of our fiscal year 19 data into that software so that we can um, start doing some of the forecasting features, which I'm looking forward to, but we just haven't quite gotten to yet. Um, so I know one of the topics that was specifically on the agenda for this evening um, is around policy and the development of an energy efficiency ordinance um, that was passed through the charter change in November and then through the legislature in May. Um, so we have a, a working group um, that includes a handful of members from the Energy Advisory Committee, some folks from Efficiency Vermont, Richard Fazy uh, from Energy Futures Group, who has basically gotten some, some outside funding to help us as a consultant through this process. Um, and so, you know, we've been meeting a number of times with that working group to start the process of developing uh, ordinance, not even language yet, but kind of concept for what we want to um, propose to the city. Uh, we've been looking at precedents from other municipalities. Uh, we had a meeting with realtors, um, and I think there were 15 or so folks that showed up for that um, to get their input because they're a critical part of this process. Um, you know, just to reiterate, what we're looking at um, is specifically around disclosure of energy use at time of sale for residential buildings at this point. Um, so specifically for um, single family and small multifamily homes. Um, and so the next step is we're going to be having a public meeting next Tuesday, starting at 6, right in here, uh, right prior, just prior to the Energy Advisory Committee meeting, um, where we are also going to present some of the same information we did to the realtors, take questions, talk about kind of the history of how this is this energy labeling has developed over time um, and get, feed, get more feedback from the public as we go into actually looking at what an ordinance language could look like. Uh, yeah, can you, can you share a bit about the response from the realtors? Um, I can a little bit. I wasn't at the meeting, so I can just oh. tell you what I, what I heard. Um, and Anne was there, so she can probably chime in if she uh, wants to. But. Um, you know, I think some skepticism, some concern about um, that this is just one more thing that could slow down a sale or, um, you know, and, and questions about whose responsibility really was it to do the disclosure, you know, who does that fall towards. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is um, one of the exciting developments <laughs> that we've just been learning about over the last couple of months is, is a tool, a software tool, that will be made available to Montpelier for free um, that the residents, either a realtor or a resident, the person who's selling their house, can use to plug in information about their home and, and create this energy label um, so that it wouldn't, they wouldn't have to have a walkthrough necessarily or um, they could they could do it at no cost basically so that that was really exciting and we're we're kind of learning more about that and trying to do some beta testing of that um, that software so that we make sure that it actually works before we try and roll it out um, but yeah I think the overall the realtors they're you know some who are really excited about this idea others that are concerned and skeptical it's fair <laughs> yeah. Accurate. yeah. I have just a couple other points. If, um, or, I, I also, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think there might be some community members who have questions, or um, should we do that at the end after? Um, let's, well, you only have a couple more bullet points. Yeah, let me just go through my bullet points, okay? and then we could take questions from the council or if they're sure. public folks. Um, so just switching to the next topic, which was our residential work. So I've um, been really excited about a, a pilot program that we're doing with Efficiency Vermont this year. Um, for the whole year of 2019, we actually have some um, staffing from Efficiency Vermont to provide um, kind of what I call concierge service, but basically like project support for multi owners of multifamily buildings um, to help them access the incentives of Efficiency Vermont. Uh, low interest financing um, and 
kind of project management support, just like helping them identify projects um, that can inf improve the efficiency of those multifamily buildings and, um, and move them along. And so we're kind of halfway through the year. Um, I don't have the stats all right in front of me, but they've, been, they've done a couple dozen walkthroughs, um, have a number of projects lined up both with Capstone um, and with 3E Thermal, which does the larger multifamily buildings weatherization. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to report back on that, but I think it's a it's an exciting model that hopefully Efficiency Vermont can replicate in other places after we show how well it works. Um, can I jump in on that? I just yeah. want to highlight that the number of total projects actually being done in Montpelier uh, is double um, what it was, uh, the, like the average of the last couple of years um, right. in terms of total projects done in multifamily buildings is very exciting so. mm -hmm. and we still yeah we're still kind of early on and yeah. and and they've been uh, Phoebe who is the the woman who's working on it from efficiency Vermont has been reaching out to some of the larger property owners or you know owners of larger properties um, which we know like if we can work with some of those folks who own hundreds of units within the city um, we can really have hopefully a bigger impact so um, and then another new project that we are excited about that is um, kind of more focused on, on individual homeowners, but also for renters, is called Window Dressers. And uh, this is a project that um, it's actually a nonprofit organization based in Maine. And what they do is they, they run community workshops to help people build low-cost interior storm windows. So they have someone, volunteers, come out to your house. They measure the size of your windows, and then a couple months later, they um, will come, it will set up for a whole week, and those folks who are interested will come and help build their actual window inserts and take them home at the end of the day, um, and at a low cost, so, you know, average 30 to $40 per window. Um, so we're really excited about bringing this to Vermont. We're one of a handful of communities in Vermont that will be part of this this year. Um, and we have secured using the hub, which is um, this multi-use space at the Berlin Mall. So we've booked that for a, a week in January. And um, starting in September, we'll be starting to do outreach about how folks can sign up to be part of this project. So stay tuned for more on that. Um, and as you may have heard, the, the legislature has approved new weatherization funding uh, through the state. And so we're... Um, you know, the, the details of that have recently been announced and we're, we're hoping to do some more outreach around that to help um, both low income and middle income folks access those new incentives. Um, and then the last section is transportation. Um, Sustainable Montpelier Co Coalition has really been taking the lead on the rollout of this idea of um, on-demand microtransit. Um, and what I've I, I have not been involved in, in much of those meetings, but um, my understanding is they have now um, decided to use this service called VIA as the, the software platform, but also have GMT operate the system. And um, pending some federal funding, they're hoping to start a pilot next summer. So it would um, be next fiscal year. But um, yeah, stay tuned for more on that. And there were also been, you know, continue to work on, on bike and pedestrian issues. And one of those was a, a mass bike ride that happened back in July. So that's my update, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, I, well, I've received multiple comments from a few different people now. The sound still isn't working on the streaming. Oh. Jamie, it's been texting me saying it's fine. Oh. Um, I'm not sure. It's one of the city employees, so I'm, I'm not sure where he's watching. Well, uh, let's see. Shall we go to, if there's other, other questions, yeah, we come back? Say, just as online. Oh, wait. Other comments or questions for Kate? Uh, Jack. I don't have a question, but I just want to say I'm always impressed by the quality of uh, your presentations and the quality and professionalism of the rest of the work. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great group. Yeah. Cool. All 
All right, well, um, any other questions, Ashley, for, um, about I this? I thought I saw a couple hands in the... As if there's questions from the public about this, yeah. Thank you. I don't have a question. Oh, do you want to introduce yourself first? Oh, Vicki Lane in Montpelier. Um, <laughs> I, um, I just want to make sure that while we're doing this real estate thing, that people like me who have worked very hard, and I only ha I have less than five more years on my mortgage, and then it's all mine, um, sort of, um, don't get penalized because we don't have the money to install the latest efficiency stuff um, in our houses, and our houses are old. And you're talking about those window insert things being 30 or $40 a window. I believe I have somewhere near 30 windows in my house. Yeah. That's a lot of money for me. It's still cheaper to me, and I have storm windows. Mm -hmm. It's still cheaper for me to put plastic on the inside of the windows mm -hmm. and works better. So I just want to make sure while you're writing this ordinance related to residential real estate, that you do not penalize those of us that are lower income and do not have the money to update to the, to the, to the hilt. Because it sounds to me as though that's where this, going, this is going. That there's going to be a mandatory energy thing. And those houses with all this wonderful energy stuff are going to go at higher prices. And we're not going to see any reduction in our taxes for that. But our houses will go at lower prices than anyone else's. And that's not fair. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, we'll be talking more, even particularly about that topic, at the hearing on the 20th. So we'll, I'll try. Well, yeah, please do. <laughs> Great. But I want to make sure the whole yes. council yep. No, it's that good. One. Other comments or questions? Ben Huffman, Cliff Street, and uh, basically, while I think this is a well-intended proposition, it is misguided from a practical point of view, and um, I don't know if this is the time to express my reservations and critique of it, but if so, I'm happy to do that. Uh, you can if you would like, um, otherwise there's I mean, going to be I, a hearing on the 20th. Yes, no, I understand that, but I think the point here is that eventually the council is going to have to approve of it. Uh, you said you did not go to the last meeting, and I'm I'm uh, would like to be sure that the council hears the diversity of points of view. So I think with that, I'd like to just go ahead and be as brief as I can. Um, I've got two or three basic reservations. The uh, practical one, primarily, is that the proposition is to create both a new function that is to be part of the real estate transaction that we're all familiar with, I think, those of us who have bought and sold real estate. But more significantly, in some regards, is it's also creating a new profession. And I guess I would just remind people who uh, may not be familiar with buying and selling real estate that we have a half a dozen professions that are involved in, in every one of those, or at least who can be. We have real estate people, we have lawyers, we have appraisers, we have building inspectors, we have um, surveyors, and we have financiers. Every one of those professions is licensed by the state and or the federal government, which has a well-established body of law and practice for a long time. And from as far as I'm concerned, I don't see the point in trying to reinvent the wheel in how to create a new profession when, when, it, when it already exists. And I'm not sure that the city is capable of doing what the state regulation and process entails of assuring that people who have been trained and are they're competent, that there is supervision of their practice, and there's adjudication when problems arise that uh, can get resolved. So I, I just think it's a foolhardy thing that you're doing. And 
if it's something that needs to be done, it ought to be done through the state legislature and adding to that process. And, and furthermore, I guess this is another point I would make. I see I've got one minute more, and this is really quite frustrating because, and I just want to say this, during the debate about this in the fall, the point was made by members of this council and other proponents of the proposition that people had to vote for the request to the legislature to have a charter change before citizens could talk about the proposition in substance. And already I, I witnessed that that's not happened. The next meeting that you're going to have on the 20th is not about that. It's about how to do it. And so I, I, I feel like the, the council has really not behaved properly in a governance sense on this one. And uh, those are my reasons. Thank you, Ben. Um, I have a, actually one question for you. What profession are you um, imagining that this is creating? Well, it's creating the profession of energy assessment. And I, I'm sorry, but there is one other point I want to make, which is part and parcel of the whole thing. Every one of those professions is a competitive proposition. And, you know, if you believe at all in competition in the marketplace, it's one way the argument is made, and I believe it, to assure that you get adequate service. And the way this has been described thus far is it's all going to be through one organization, Efficiency Vermont. And I think that is, a, you know, a second mistake of creating essentially a monopoly on something which is going to be required by law and you know there what's to have what's to create the safeguard the things that you don't want to have happen happen there which the existing system that i've alluded to through the licensing regulation of professionals is already set up to, to, to do thank you can I just make a clarification? Please, yes. um, so the, the model that we are exploring right now, and I, I, I do want to say that it is nothing is set in stone. We are, it's, it, this is an ongoing process you know, that we're looking to take a year or two with. So we're not trying to rush anything through. But, um, but that it is not creating a new profession and that it would be a disclosure of the owner, um, the seller. That's a problem. So, but I, but I just want to, just like you do lead, lead paint disclosure when you're selling your home, this would be similar to that in that the, the seller could fill out this form basically um, with information about their home and make that available at no cost. So it would be, it wouldn't require hiring a, a separate professional. I also want to clarify that uh, the, just reiterate that the uh, meeting on the 20th is about um, just exploring what has been done elsewhere in the country and, um, and hearing people's concerns, mm -hmm. oh, uh, and also what's been done in Vermont as well. Mm -hmm. Steve Whitaker. Uh, <coughs> Steve Whitaker. Uh, I want to uh, second the concerns raised by Mr. Huffman. Uh, while he and I might not agree on anything else, <laughs> you're dating decades back. Uh, this is something I was trained as an energy auditor of schools and hospitals by the Lawrence Berkeley lab many many decades ago and it is a profession and we might need to approach this in a way that could be uh, rolled out statewide that if we're going to reach our energy goals our net zero goals in Montpelier or statewide or have a meaningful dent in climate disruption uh, we will need a profession of precision energy auditors who can accurately disclose the energy demand of a building before it's sold and or find economical ways to do it. So I don't think tippy-toeing around or evading that point, but I think a competitive model of trained professionals, this could be a curriculum that started now in Vermont Technical College or whatever, and I would encourage you to look at it and approach it from that angle that uh, we would need a competitive market. We would need trained the skill set for residential buildings that will be different than the skill set for commercial buildings. My skills are rusty on that topic by now, but I won't pretend to know state of the art. But I do think it's an opportunity for us to create economic development 
uh, and job training which are relevant to today's needs. I just I want to thank Ben for coming and making comments and Stephen that I really see us in a wide spectrum taking comments all the meetings that happen all the comments here to then look at that and then again if indeed we come up with a written policy that'll be talked about again so it's lots of time we're not trying to do anything too quick um, uh, any other besides uh, anybody who hasn't spoken on this topic yet uh, there's someone else speaking. Sorry, thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Jeff Rubin. I run a nonprofit for sustainable heating, and I just thought I would quickly add to your knowledge base here uh, about the Appraisal Institute, which is the national association that uh, uh, qualifies and educates appraisers. And uh, they do have a fairly new addendum called the Green Addendum. And um, I'm not sure if this is already on your radar, but if it's not, it should be. It is not free. In fact, it costs more than a regular appraisal. Um, but it is also um, an, an option uh, rather than a requirement. So just wanted to add that to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, Don, is that posted anywhere? I mean, like the guidelines that's under a green appraisal? Something you could send us? Sure. A green you addendum. Want to, if you want to give me a, a, a Maybe you already have it. I don't, I just know it's coming. <laughs> if you want to give me a card with an email address, I can send you the mic. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Any other, um, anyone who hasn't spoken on this topic yet? Okay, do you have something further to add, Vicki? Yeah. I still haven't heard anyone express concern for people, and I'm sure there are many in my situation. We're living on shrinking for fixed incomes. We, ha we own property that someday might need to be sold. And I didn't hear that this was an optional thing. I've, what I've been reading sounded as though this was going to be a requirement when you sold your house to have this thing done. And I do agree with him. It needs to be a licensed person, not just Joe Blow off the street or Efficiency Vermont with their own agenda. It needs to be a licensed person, the same as I had to do for being a licensed CPA or a licensed tax person. So I still have not heard any concern for how this is going to affect those of us that can't afford all this stuff unless you're planning on having some grants, not loans, not low interest loans, but grants for people to put things and do things in their homes. Otherwise, it's not fair. Thank you, Vicki. And just so you and, and everyone is aware, there is no evidence in places around the country where this has been tried. Um, there's no evidence that uh, it lowers the value of anyone's home, um, even, if it's, in, even if it's not um, you know, terribly efficient. Thank you. All right, any other comments? Okay, thank you so much. All right, so we have um, an item relating to the zoning uh, near Savings Pasture, um, the, the VCFA parcel. Um, welcome. Uh, yes, Glenn. And I'm just going to say I am going to recuse myself from this item. My partner, Kate Stevenson, is working this, working on this, not in her volunteer capacity, but her professional capacity. So I'm going to leave this item to the rest of you folks. I will be back when it's over. Back. <laughs> OK, so we are here today uh, to talk about um, proposal that we have to change the zoning line on the current VCFA parcel. So we want to tell you a little bit about this project that is in early conceptual design and then explain the change that we're requesting. Um, that would be uh, part of the proposed zoning fixes, potentially, that would be under council consideration in September. So I'll let you kick off. Hi, I'm Casey Ellison. 
Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about the project, uh, and then Kate's going to get a little more specific about what we're asking for. Um, basically, we're in contract right now with VCFA on the 18-acre parcel of land that's adjacent to Sabin's pasture. Um, we are uh, interested in creating two different projects, phase one and phase two, we're calling it right now. Um, phase one includes what we're calling a bathhouse, and um, this is a what we're calling we're calling it a bathhouse specifically because um, you could maybe be more familiar with the word spa, but this is more of a community project, which includes things that might you might see at a spa: saunas, steam rooms, pools, um, other such facilities for people to use for health reasons and you know happiness and and um, keeping warm in the winter. Um, but it's it's designed more around accessibility for the community, and um, so that's why we're calling it a bathhouse. A lot of people don't aren't familiar with that word, so we like to just give a little little blurb on what that is to us. Um, so phase one is that that bathhouse, and phase two is uh, going to be or proposed to be um, some small scale, beautiful sort of housing, a small housing development, that, which we've identified as probably maximum 40 units with some commercial space and some retail space located right down on Berry Street um, at the bottom of that parcel. So the, the reason that we're coming to you today is we've started the conceptual site planning process, um, really spending time on the site and looking at how to locate these various buildings. Um, and in that process of really doing our due diligence on the permitting um, requirements, this project will go through Act 250. Um, so we're looking at all the pieces of that. Um, but then specifically relating to the city of Montpelier zoning, this parcel is fairly unique in that um, it encompasses three different zoning types. Um, so the top part, which is closest to VCFA and, you know, the College Green, is uh, mixed-use residential currently. The middle section is um, residential 24,000, which is a very low-density residential zone. And then the area closest to Berry Street is the Riverfront District, which is high-density and allows all kinds of commercial uses. And as we started to look at this, we you know, had a lot of, we've been meeting with the planning department staff, had some questions about exactly where does this line between riverfront and residential 24,000 fall? Um, because the, the spot that we're interested in placing, the bathhouse, is kind of right on that edge. Um, and the difference between the, the line maps that you download from the city and what we were told 450 feet back from Berry Street, there's, there's a little bit of um, gray area about exactly where the line is. Um, so we want to be super clear about that going forward as we go into the site planning process and um, looking at how this, these zoning areas were developed um, in the 2018 zoning rewrite, um, what we'd like to propose is that the, the line, the divider line, match the adjacent Zorzi parcel, which is the Sabin's pasture parcel. Um, so our proposal is to move the dividing line back. Um, so we've got this map. <laughs> residential is the, the yellow. We're not proposing to any change there. But basically, there's a shaded area of about 0.9 acres um, that, would, that we're proposing be added to the riverfront district. And you can see this is approximately the site of the bathhouse that we're looking at. Um, so it's kind of right on the existing dividing line between the two sections. So if we were able to change this line and line it up with the Zorzi side, that would give us 
a little more area to design the kind of the approach, the driveway and road that will go up to the bathhouse. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit about kind of why that why? spot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jay, can you point out where the residential is going to be, the, the units? The housing units, yeah. And um, when you say housing units, do you mean like single family or? Multi-family. No, it'll be, um, it's going to be um, a project that is a Do you want to take the mic out of the uh, yeah. stand that you So, Again, it's all very conceptual, but um, we've been hearing a lot that Montpelier needs more housing that's um, you know, friendly and approachable and beautiful, and we're interested in community projects. So this um, would be a place that would, and again, we don't have any details on the design yet, but small scale um, with a lot of uh, thought around how it feels to be there for people. The it's, it's going to be housing that's approachable for all different kinds of people, so we definitely have room for all kinds of discussions around that. Yes, absolutely, and yes, accessible. Um, so yeah, small scale, beautiful, and eco-friendly uh, housing n down right near Berry Street. So we are interested in maintaining the integrity of this piece of land as well, so we are interested in keeping the housing down here. And that's actually one of the reasons that we want to request this zoning change um, through looking at the land in order for us to keep enough space for the housing and the bathhouse. If the bathhouse is allowed to be tucked in just a little further here, um, it gives us a little more room to kind of do the housing down closer to Barry versus having to move it up the hill. So um, that's another reason. So this, this area here, it's, it's a bit of a complicated site. And um, so any, every, you know, bit of space here matters. The topography of this, the site is a little bit friendlier, just a little higher up. Um, down here, we're concerned that we might have to do more blasting or more earth moving if we, were, if we needed to build lower down. So one of our interests is keeping this low impact. Also, if we are able to move it up here, it gives us less of a likelihood of having to be you know visible and affecting the Sabin Street folks, which we're we're concerned about their um, sightline and their you know happiness as well. So um, you know just examining this site very specifically, we feel that this makes a really big difference being able to move it up a little bit. Um, also, considering that it's a community project, this prof this project is not driven by profit. This is driven by the desire to create community space for the people in our community that we love and care about. We would like to save costs if we can, you know, but if we have to build in a, a different spot, we're looking at a lot more, a lot higher engineering costs. Basically, is what it comes down to. So, can I help turn her around? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, anything that I should clarify with, with that? Um, yeah, why don't you just go over what you said again? <laughs> <laughs> so we know what you're saying. Here. Sure. Um, well, you guys have the same map, but if you're just looking at it, yeah, put the orange on the bottom. And um, yeah, so basically, just in, like Kate said, our first, you know, thought was just consistency, kind of keeping the zoning line consistent with Zorzi. Um, we had heard that it was a bit arbitrary. Um, so when we looked at the site without knowing where the zoning line was um, in actuality, we just placed the building in a way that felt like it would be the most natural to the land, the, the least obtrusive, the least destructive. Um, and then when we went and did the actual GPS points, we realized that we were kind of straddling the line. So we decided that we should try to ask for a modification there. Um, and we would like to keep the housing down near Berry Street um, because it's kind of um, a little bit more of a lively, like a, we want it to be approachable. We want it to be like you're coming to it from the street whereas the bathhouse, we would like to be tucked in a little bit more, so um, which would kind of maintain the character of this land here. We'd like to keep this all pretty much like how it is. Um, 
tucked in just for privacy for the people that live here basically if you're getting out into this field you're you know we're not interested in really developing this field so if it's kind of tucked into these trees here it's just a little less obtrusive and also for the character of the building and being inside the building it's supposed to be kind of like a natural space where you're kind of encountering the trees around you and um, you know in a kind of a calmer atmosphere so um, keeping that kind of tucked in here and this all down here sort of interacting with what's going on on Barry Street is our intention. So if we have to move this guy, the bathhouse down, it really affects what we're able to fit and how we're able to fit it down here um, because we're not really interested in cramming anything in. We really want to make it nice. So. That's, that's most of it, and we've, you know, the questions that we've heard or the concerns that we've heard are more, you know, around, of course, we, like, we have the, the Sabin Street folks in mind. Um, we've spoken with, with some of them um, already. With, we've met with the group, the Sabin Street neighbors, and there was concerns about, well, if we change this zoning, doesn't that mean that there's the ability to put much more housing here? Um, in fact, for us, it's not, that's not really, um, even on the table, you know, we're just concerned with building this one building here. And this is actually zoned for housing, this Res 24. Um, but that's not what we're doing with it. So um, in the interest of actually keeping the, the character of this land, we believe that this change will actually be really helpful. So did I miss anything? OK. Um, we'd like to be, we're, again, we're still very conceptual. We're also still in feasibility. so. Um, it will be helpful to know the outcome of this kind of thing for us to make sure that we can uh, achieve what we'd like to. But our feasibility period with VCFA ends in the end of September. So we're, we're you know, the, the purchase will happen in the end of September if everything's, you know, all systems go. And um, it's a big project, so we'll be designing for quite a while. We, we hope to be just starting to possibly possibly do some site work next fall, um, but the construction won't likely begin until spring of 2021. Purchase. The purchase of the land? Me. Yeah. Uh, so the way I'm, I'm um, imagining the structure of this conversation is, is if there's any questions um, that the council has at this point, um, and then I'd like to take uh, comments or questions from the public and then we'll come back to the council for um, further thoughts on what you want to do. Should I keep um, this like this? Yeah, or? maybe like a catty corner. So yeah, that's great. Super. That works. Um, any questions that councilors have? Yes. I remember this was one of the parcels that we had extensive discussion about. Yes. I would like to. Well, I mean, I guess the, the request is that we revisit a decision that a prior council made about this and so uh, I think it's important that the council take some time to reflect on why those changes were made and the map was shaped the way it was. Okay. Other questions? If not, then that's fine. Um, uh, comments or questions from the public? Uh, page, or whoever. Hi, I'm Paige Gurton. Um, I'm speaking as a private citizen, not a Conservation Commission member. Um, I have a couple of questions, and the first one is, would you consider swapping phase one and phase two and building the housing first? Um, wondering if that is a possibility since that's really what the community needs. Um, and I'd like to learn a little bit more about the bathhouse and what its purpose is. I guess I would caution the council to be very careful about making changes at the request of an individual who wants to do something with the property that it wasn't intended to use for in the first place. Um, and that's, you know, it's not, it was basically that whole parcel seems to have been zoned or the intent of the zoning was for housing. And while I would love to see part of the parcel kept open, I think housing is what we need and is the best use of the whole parcel. So that's all. Thank you. 
Hi, Joe Castellano, Sabin Street. I'm one of the abutters. I have handouts. Okay, um, Casey has been very kind and has already met with a number of the neighbors, gotten some of our input. Um, based on the meeting that we had at the Planning Commission the other night, I used our GS, GIS uh, mapping uh, program to kind of at least delineate how many acres of the parcel. It's an 18-acre parcel, and the riverfront is a little less than five acres, plus or minus. I mean, I was kind of just roughly scaling it based on the handout that Kate provided us at the meeting. And it looks like what is being considered for the zoning alignment, I know Kate said it was 0.9, I came up with 1.17, it doesn't matter to me, but that's roughly about like 5% of the parcel. Then the res 24,000 is five acres, and then the mixed use is 7.24 acres. If you look at what I've delineated to the right of the 1.17 acres, that's the proposed zoning uh, change area. So that's essentially what we're talking about. Now my house actually abuts the riverfront, but it's my neighbors who's probably gonna be impacted more, the Dan Clark and Aaron Brondike, by the rezoning. I guess some of the concerns of the neighbors are that, um, you know, their parcels would be if the development were, or the zoning alignment were not to change, then they would be less severely impacted than if it were to change to Riverfront, because Riverfront allows for a much greater density, much greater uh, differentiation in use. The other thing that has a concern of ours is the uh, 40, I also calculated what the slopes were, and basically about where they're uh, proposing to site the bathhouse is between, there's a 40% slope followed by a 30% slope, and that's gonna be very costly to engineer and also costly to develop, and that was, also provided uh, some, in I had some input from Michael Hoffman, who's an Act 50 permit specialist when talking about this. Um, our concern is just the increased density if it is, if the zoning alignment is allowed. And I know that a number of us are concerned about the financial fi feasibility of the SPA proposal. And a number of us are concerned that if this doesn't move forward or financially it doesn't work out, that it gets sold to another developer and then it, it it, we end up with a development that it adversely impacts the neighborhood. So that's just my concern. Um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Jeff Rubin, and I am the adjacent property owner to the west on Barry Street. And um, uh, first of all, thank you, Councilperson Hill for saying that there is some history here. Um, as I understand it, that the, uh, the, the zoning line as it's drawn now was not arbitrary, that the way it was originally contemplated was that uh, commendably, the idea was to move uh, housing down near Barry Street and to leave more open space up the hill. Um, the original uh, line was 300 feet from the center line of Barry Street, and then the um, uh, person at VCFA made their arguments at the time of the zoning and uh, had that line move from 300 feet to 450 feet. And of course that adds to an increase in total density. The uh, contemplated change in the zoning line would add another, uh, I think, 34 units uh, to the available units to be placed in um, uh, on the uh, riverfront section. So um, uh, that creeping increase in density is, is of some concern. And um, it, it is a complicated site. I think prior to the uh, change in the slope ordinances just a couple of months ago, it wouldn't have been permitted on a 40% slope anyway. So there's a lot of land there. It seems to me there's a lot of ways to skin the cat and to put um, uh, a, a building of that size uh, on a site of that size. Um, <clears throat> 
it's a little difficult because there's no actual proposal in front of us at this time. So uh, if, the, uh, if the zoning line change were to be uh, adopted, uh, I would request that the council consider some language that uh, at least keeps the uh, density at the current level. Um, and uh, so that's my, that's my comment. I also have a question because I've heard uh, a lot that the community needs additional housing and I've also heard some counter arguments that we're actually losing population. And I'm wondering if the uh, council can guide me to any uh, studies or documents where that um, uh, provide data on the need for uh, additional housing in the community. I think the vacancy rate, at least in terms of rental, the, the need for rental units, I mean, the vacancy rate is less than 1%. I think, and I think I'm the only renter on the council right now. Um, and trying to find an apartment here every time I've had to try has been, I mean, like a, a months long endeavor, you know, just trying to like make it all work. Um, I, I think too, the other piece is, um, I would, I would actually drill your question down a little further, which is a question about market rate housing uh, versus, um, you know, mixed income housing developments where there might be um, community development block grants, CDBG money available versus like, you know, um, either housing with uh, landlords or developers that would accept section eight which we have a significant demand for in Montpelier. I mean, the lists alone, I mean, if, if you're on a list to wait for a voucher, you're waiting, I think, the last time I checked it was six to eight months to actually get into permanent, so yeah. I mean, so the fact that you've got people in transitional housing for two years in this area, I mean, says pretty clearly there's a huge demand, at least for, rental housing, you know, I, I'm certainly never going to be in the single family home market because I bought an education, which was foolish, but, um, it, you know, I have a mortgage on my brain that I'll never live long enough to pay off and they can't even foreclose on it. Um, you know, and, and so I, I would actually drill down further. Is it really a need for single family homes or is it a need for different approaches to housing? Um, so that's the first time I've heard that. So thank you. It's, okay. it's pretty hard trying to find places to live in this town. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm, this is the first I'm getting acquainted with this proposal, so I am not as well prepared. But I'd point out that moving a zoning line is not an approval of a project. This would have still have full Act 250 vetting review, et cetera. So, I don't see the harm in allowing for the possibility of exploring and designing something which would be very thoroughly scrutinized. I question whether that's the best location for a bathhouse for accessibility by the whole town, but uh, time will tell. Um, and I would encourage you to at least not foreclose the opportunity to explore this in full detail. Um, Thank you. You mean I have to yell? Um, I have to echo what Ashley said. What we need in, not, in Montpelier is not more housing. We need more affordable housing, and I'm talking about really affordable housing. If I had not been fortunate enough 25 years ago to be able to get my house at the price I got it, there is not a chance in the world I could live in Montpelier because the rents for uh, the rents are practically higher than what I receive every month to live on. And so I, I think, you know, we need to get right down to it and say we need affordable housing. I cannot imagine paying the rents. I don't know how a student or someone coming out of college I mean, I was fortunate enough to get my degrees um, before it got so expensive to get degrees, but it, it just, I, I mean, we're making it impossible for someone to get a rental and maybe also save to maybe get that first home 
that they might dream about getting. So I think we need to remember that it's not just housing we need. We need affordable housing. And I'd like to trade a bathhouse, a bathhouse. People my age don't think positively when we hear that, unless there's a swimming pool involved, um, for housing, affordable housing. This is going to be the last thing because then um, I need to leave. Um, again, uh, my name is Lawrence Seiler, and I have to incline to agree with, um, I don't know the um, lady's name back there, but um, we need more affordable housing, especially for people with disabilities, people with special needs. Um, I would kind of, um, if I um, was able to, I would decline the bathhouse because I just looked up definitions of a bathhouse and the, historically bathhouses have not been good. Uh, so if there is a bathhouse, sanitation, you know, it needs to be sanitarily good and as well as policed because years ago in bathhouses there used to be like prostitution and this is something you don't want in the city of Montpelier. So um, it being a private citizen as well as an advocate for people with special needs, I would have to decline the bathhouse but more affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Okay. Uh, comments from council, Jack. I think that uh, the most pressing need for the city of Montpelier is more housing, more affordable housing, more housing at, at all levels. I think it is vital to be able to uh, enable people to develop housing, particularly on, uh, on Savings Pasture, because that's one of the few large uh, undeveloped parcels in the city. I uh, think that uh, the increase in density is is not a bad thing, but a good thing. And uh, density enables us to not only provide more housing for the people who need housing, who would live here if they could uh, find housing they could afford, or if they could find housing, period. Uh, density also enables us to uh, move towards our energy efficiency goals. Density is uh, more efficient than uh, acre lots with uh, single family housing on them. I uh, would certainly, I assume, I, I'd certainly like to see, take this up in more detail as I know we will. I'm inclined to uh, be very supportive of this though. I'm sure the developer does not, is not planning to uh, establish a facility where uh, prostitution and anonymous sexual encounters will be uh, practiced. Um, but uh, I think this could, could be uh, a beneficial addition to the community, but it's not my project. I'm not, I'm not building it, and I'm not putting my money into it, so I'm not in a position to tell her what to do with it. Um, I, uh, I don't think that uh, a change in, uh, in zoning of approximately 5% of this parcel and approximately 1% of the entirety of the savings pasture is, uh, is something that would have a major impact on, uh, on the character of the parcel or on the character of the neighborhood and um, I think that we are long past the time where people should, uh, people anywhere should expect that uh, they can prevent uh, housing development from Savings Pasture now and forever into the future. Other comments? Donna. I also like diversified housing, and 
I think you better pick another name than bathhouse. I think it has old time connotations. <laughs> okay, somebody who still does water therapy on her knee. I was interested in hot bathtub. <laughs> um, but I think it sounds exciting and a new possibility. And I was here in the council when we went through all the zoning. And it may have not been arbitrary, but I don't remember solid reasons exactly why that line was where it was at. And I also feel like we have to be willing to have more density if we want more density down by Berry Street, you know, and the whole bicycle path, the whole connection, and that whole community is very dense for people to come and use services, what you put there. Because we did talk about having also local shops so people could shop in their neighborhood because you're part of the savings past your neighborhood, but not savings past your lot. Right. And so we're hoping to have more housing over there. So I like seeing these kinds of ideas, and I, I would support this. Uh, Connor. Yeah, and no, I, I agree with Ashley. I think you're busy growing or you're busy dying here, and we're kind of in a crisis mode where we're going to have to look at, like, rent stabilization or something if it keeps going this way. So. Adding some density makes sense to me. Uh, we've already banned prostitution on our ordinances, so I'm not too worried about that either. <laughs> so uh, I, I'd be comfortable with this. There's still a lot of hoops to go through for you. Um, Ashley, did you want to weigh in? Uh, I, oh, that's okay. I'm still, I am looking at zoning maps and okay. my old notes. So that's I'm going to pass. Okay. I'd also like to point out that the proposal before the council tonight, you're not finally approving this. This is really to give a signal. The Planning Commission is preparing the final draft for your public hearings. And so this really just be saying you could include that in that draft. You could still then take it out if you chose to during, you have to go through the two public hearings to adopt with all the other zoning changes. So um, there, there's at least two more bites at the apple on this issue for the public and for yourselves in terms of the process ahead of you. So we need a motion then to encourage to include it in the draft that comes back to us. Yes, in the zoning okay. fixes that is going to be warned for um, September, I forget what the date 11. is, 11th. We need to wait until then to get back? I don't Glenn, think, Glenn can't I don't vote think on he's, this. Glenn's not. Oh, he's not. Oh, he's not. That's right. Sorry, I forgot why you left. left. <laughs> uh, well, I'll make a motion that we include this request draw to redraw the zoning line for the density in the drafts that we're going to be getting from the planning department for our considerations in the future. Second. Uh, for the discussion. Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. And so I'm going to vote aye to make a fourth. And so the motion passes. So this will be a part of that um, package on uh, in the September uh, zoning changes. So thank you. Thank you. Before we move to the uh, next item, I'm hearing people still saying they can't right, don't have video on the screen. It's, it's through the city website that it's not working. Okay. Uh, all right. It is um, eight o'clock. Uh, do you want to take a break now? Do you want to keep moving forward? What do you want to do? Short break. Five minutes. Okay, we're going to take a five-minute break, and then um, we will dive into this topic. Great. All right, so we are up to um, an item um, related to the creation of a uh, task force to address homelessness in Montpelier. Um, uh, basically, a continuation of a conversation that... Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. Sorry can't, about that. Can't skip out on the quick yeah, no, zoning. I, I got to go home, so... <laughs> I apologize. Right, zoning update, please, go ahead. Um, so this should be um, really quick, because uh, we met on June 26th to discuss the draft fixes, and I was asked to review some uh, section, including 3103 on community facilities. I did, I reviewed that with our city attorneys. The next section after it is accessory dwelling units, and they also reviewed that one and made some recommendations. Uh, I don't know if you guys really care how we get into the what what they recommended, but. The, the recommendation was we'll follow state law and reference to state law and here are the, the ones. So we're not going to restate state law. We're just going to say these community facilities that are identified under state law, by state law we only have a limited number of things we can review 
and we will respect the limitations as established under state law. But we're not going to restate the rule because the rule could change over time. So that was a recommendation of our city attorney, and I think that was a recommendation of maybe Lauren or somebody else that made that. Um, so we did follow through with that. Um, the brief changes were made to accessory dwelling units. Um, just to clarify, because we had some unique rules that we had made about if you've got a single family home, you can have a duplex. Well, they, they started to kind of collide with the accessory dwelling <coughs> unit rules. And so our attorneys made a few minor changes to, to clarify to make sure that was good. Um, there was a change, there was a court decision on the Oxford comma. So um, they now honor the Oxford comma. So if you don't have it in, they will read it as if it's that's what you intended. And so we went through and did a technical review for Oxford commas and added those in. So just if you see changes in there that weren't there before, that's that's where the, we did an Oxford comma. And the last one was we had found a, uh, some places where land development, um, we had done some search for places in developing this draft where we had always said land development and we said we're just saying things we don't need to, we can just say development. And for some reason, we didn't complete that search because we found a whole chunk of them that were still in there. So those are the four sets of changes that are currently in the draft. You just approved a fifth change with the zoning change for VCFA. So I just wanted to give you guys a quick update and let you know I will incorporate, I will take all these. They're actually already on the website under the zoning fixes tab. Um, we'll put the map on tomorrow. So that will be on, and I will prepare this to get warned, um, including we because of the zoning change, we will have to amend the required report under state law, which is just a legal thing. And I will work with Kirby, uh, the Planning Commission Chair, to get that done. And so we will be ready for the public hearings on the, on the 11th, September 11th, and September 25th. So. Any questions? From Yes. I make a motion to approve the changes to the draft so the staff can have warm public hearings for September 11th and 25th. Second. Further discussion? Any comments from the public? Okay. Uh, hearing none, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Onward. Apparently, I've been one item ahead of myself this entire meeting. And I apologize. Good. So now we are on to um, the uh, Homelessness Task Force. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bill, sure. I suppose, to sort of explain where we're at. Uh, at our last meeting, um, we had a long discussion about uh, the needs of homeless people, the needs of the downtown, and related issues, and how, how the city could best uh, weigh in. And, at the end of it, the council opted to uh, form a task force to look at some of the ways and asked staff to sort of put together the outline of what that might, what a task force might take up and what it might look so. So in, in doing so, uh, we, our, our staff group met and kind of and thought through uh, some of the issues and sort of the, the why, what, how, et cetera what would be the purpose of it, these sort of things, and then who might be included. Uh, and so we, we had a little bit of an outline, and then we invited some of the providers just to get a sense of what they felt were gaps and what they felt might be needs and could be helped. Uh, we, we weren't intending to include them as members of the task force, but simply to get their input as we thought about that. So it all ended up in a relatively short outline that you have. We recommended a certain uh, makeup of the task force that was not based on any uh, science. We were trying to make sure it was manageable size and people that we thought. We've since received several suggestions from community other community members uh, about the makeup, some of whom are here. And I think those are all very uh, well thought of uh, suggestions as well. So it's, it's really, I'd leave that to the council of how you want this task force com composed, who would be on it. Um, and the one thing I think that we did conclude in terms of, of this issue as moving forward is that to be effective, that we have to look at what's before us here in our community. And it's very easy to, to think about all the root causes of, of, of homelessness. And 
to go down those paths, but I, th I think we have to stay away from that. I, you know, not that, not that those aren't important, but this group can't focus on alcoholism or substance abuse or domestic violence or you know housing costs and those kind of things. It's really got to be about the people who are in this situation and what they need and how they connect to services and how they can best be served and, and how we can um, meet their needs, whether it's to transition them into housing or just provide them shelter or get you know, better ways to get them services. And it, it might, even it might be things as, you know, are there public bathrooms or accessibility to showers or laundry or whatever those needs are. And because it would, you know, the, the city of Montpelier is not gonna solve the root causes of homelessness. This is a you know, national, international issue. And, um, but this is one thing we can do is to help the people in need in our community. So that was our, kind of our scope, so to speak. And uh, we'll leave it up to you where you wanna go with it. So again, I'd love to take um, comments or ideas from counselors, hear from the public, and then um, revisit where we go. So, Connor. Yeah, just quick thought. I, I agree with you, Bill. It's uh, not the city alone that can fix this issue. Um, I'm wondering if there's any thought to inviting a member of our delegation, Mary Hooper comes to mind, just to have that link with the state legislature and any resources we can draw down from that. Um, yeah, just a thought there. In invite somebody into the fold there. So, you know, I, again, we could I, we didn't think of that. So it wasn't thought of and rejected. Uh, I think there's, you know, you could have a, so you get a really long list of people and that's great. I think there are certain sizes of groups that work well and certain sizes that don't. So I don't, wouldn't want to exclude people, but I also think if you're going to be functional, you've got to have a functional size. Obviously, everyone can participate. So, like I said, the size and com composition is really up to you. We were, th we really were thinking, hey, if you have five people, you can really work together and dig in. But it, it, we also recognize it's a lot of people being left out. So. Um, um, first, thanks very much, Bill, for setting this up, and thanks all the community members for coming last time and this time to talk it over. I think my uh, basic question is around the, the schedule, when we might expect this task force first to meet and, and get down to work. It seems to me um, related to that that we're likely to start faster with a smaller group only because we can coordinate fewer schedules together. Um, and Bill, I don't know if you have a, a, an idea about how quickly we could, we could convene it. I think group. the group can meet as soon as it's identified. So I would say your goal for tonight would be to decide either specific people that you want to put on or uh, a process for putting specific people on, or the size, the representation, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, we can move that. Um, you know, we're now back on an every two week schedule, so, you know, possibly even appoint people at the next meeting. And, I, and then it's just a question of how soon they can be reconvened in a meeting. I mean, there's no, there's no reason for any delay. Uh, and that's actually one of the reasons why we, we had the meeting with the the providers was to not have to wait before we got some base information. So. Uh, Donna. Uh, I, I like the small size, but I think you need more than one homeless person there. And I like the idea of having your resources separated, like Mary Hooper and others that you've listed, so they're available, they can be copied when your meetings are, but that you keep your core functioning separately. And we also got some emails suggesting places who are already working with this and how grants that they got. So I hope we're looking into that too. Yeah. So again, I have no pride of ownership of, of, of who's on this. You know, this was our stab at what a group might look like if if you all want to change the makeup of it entirely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, other comments? No. Uh, Jack. Go ahead. I, I really appreciate the work that's been done. My inclination is to uh, think that uh, a bigger group is probably not a huge group, but I think more in the seven or eight people range than five people range to make sure we have uh, enough chance for 
everyone who should participate to be participating, keeping in mind that I know once we set up the group, any member of the public would be eligible to come and participate. Great. Any other comments? No, that's fine. And I'm sure, Stephen, you are here because you want to say something. Yep. <laughs> OK. Is, uh, am I able to be heard? Um, I applaud the work that went into setting up that meeting and getting that memo out. Um, I want to ask the council, I uh, vigorously and sincerely want to ask the council to consider a different structure for the, the committee. Um, I've been working on this. As you know, I've been asking you to deal with this since before the Bethany Church warming shelter closed. Uh, it has gone from bad to worse, and I don't think the recognition of the immediacy of these impacts is well is is felt by the general public or even the council members. Uh, some of the homeless folks charged their phones at a pedestal out in front of La Brioche. Recently, a padlock appeared on that electrical outlet. I mean, the the. Someone might not be able to call for help if they need it because their phone is dead, just because of these little simple things. So what I've done is I've been doing my own kind of inventory of folks, uh, both providers and passionate citizen advocates, as well as a count in Barrie and Montpelier, uh, Berlin. Um, and I've sent a memo to Bill recommending some folks that are willing. I have, has that been circulated? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to point out that I met Ronna Gable because she was taking care of, in her off time, private time, was taking care of uh, Alex, the, the big Negro gentleman who uh, couldn't walk very well, had diabetes, et cetera. Um, and she and I looked out for him for a while. Um, she works for Washington County Mental Health. She's expert, but she would participate in such an action, offered to participate, not in her official role, but as her citizen. She's got a husband and kids and stuff, and she still cares so much. This is the kind of people you need to, to be working on this. Um, Tyler Strange staffed one of the uh, overflow shelters uh, during the last winter, and he has been actively engaged in uh, trying to create a workforce project where homeless folks could get a leg up in some job skills doing job site cleanup or demolition, possibly even in concert with the Home Farm Road project. Uh, he's open and engaged and willing to serve on this. Uh, Morgan Brown, you know I won't speak for. Uh, he's not here tonight because he's uh, recovering from his neighbor's recent demise. Uh, Will is formerly homeless himself, and now he's the regional supervisor for both Lamoille and Washington County for the Office of Economic Opportunity, which funds Good Sam. He offered to participate in this, not in his official role, but in his citizen advocate role. I think that's invaluable. So this team, and Zach can speak for himself, uh, expert, uh, knowledgeable, passionate, dedicated. Uh, so the fact that here are, and myself, as you know, I care a lot about this issue. So I have proposed early when I first recommended this task force that a that it be a three-town task force. I right now realize that scope would be too dilute. Each of these towns needs its own task force. And my hope is that Montpelier moving first and forming such a task force will see the creation of one in Barrie uh, and, and or Berlin. But I've put in my little memo to Bill that a possible liaison from Barrie and Berlin could participate here. But my recommendation is that we not put counselors. I've tried for months to get a couple of counselors to meet with the former director of another way. It's, it's not um, the type of effective spontaneity, passion, and we've got to write a plan that deals with this week 
and the one week horizon, the four week horizon, the six week, the eight week, the 12 week. We need to write a two year plan that's going to eventually end up with micro houses, you know, and shelters and social service liaison, et cetera. So I, I know it's a lot of information, but I believe that I've done my homework here and identified a team of six, uh, which you feel free and it's at your discretion to add to. But I would ask you not to delay. If, if you want to advertise for some more and vet and consider, but I'd ask you to do that as an add-on later, but you get the project started. Winter is coming on. Uh, there are immediate needs now, and you've got some really qualified people here ready to do the work. Thanks. Thank uh, yes, come on up. So hello again. Uh, my name is Erica Rail. I work for the Vermont Center for Independent Living. We're a cross-disability organization. Um, when I was looking at the suggested list, I realized that you had all mental health advocates and nobody for other disabilities on the list. Um, we have people on staff um, that have autism, developmental disabilities, people that are blind, deaf, um, and these people are also homeless. Um, and so I'm wondering if you'd also consider a member of our staff, myself, or somebody on our staff on this task force because not only are there people with mental health and recovery issues that are homeless, there's also people that are wheelchair users, people with uh, developmental disabilities, people that are deaf that are also homeless and need services as well. Um, we know resources that are out there. Um, we know how to get things in alternative formats. Um, we also know that services, other uh, services that are available. Thanks. Thank you. Is, are those, um, I apologize. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Sorry. Um, no, that's fine. Would it be possible for you to send an email to maybe Bill Frazier? Already did. He did. She sent us one today. Oh. I don't know okay. that I, I might. I might not have checked my counsel. <laughs> and, and I just reforward. I know you got it. But I just reforwarded Steve's forward email to. I know, but I just the one from Steve earlier. I just sent it just now again. Mm -hmm. So you should be top yep. of your list right now. If you want. I <coughs> Sorry. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments? Mm -hmm. I um, Zach Hughes again. Um, I uh, have a wealth of knowledge in this area, and I um, and I recognize that we need to target one section of the issue um, yeah, and not be all over the place because we can't do that um, because it's such a big, a big thing. So I'm just going to say that I'm willing to serve in any capacity that the city council would uh, desire. I was in Washington, D.C. when this first came up, um, so I was unable to be down here. Um, I issued a couple statements on it. Uh, I uh, run outreach efforts out there, um, basically by talking with people, seeing how they're doing. Um, and just, you know, if they don't want to talk, I move along. So anyway, thank you, and I will serve in any capacity. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay, other comments? I would like to just conclude oh, with... Okay. Sorry, well, let's no. see if there's anybody else who hasn't yeah. spoken yet. Yeah. First of all, I, I think it needs to be said that, and I know that I've heard it said several times, I've heard many, many people come up to me and say, you know, at at soup kitchens or at the bank or, you know, any number of other things that people have basically said, thank you for actually showing up and thank you for actually showing an active interest because I understand 
that there's a lot of people that are more interested in doing other things and I care about this town and I care about the way that things are done here. Um, perhaps, and I, I hesitate to say this, but perhaps on a level that other people, you know, they're, they're, they're stuck in their, you know, they're in their lives. They're doing whatever it is they're trying to do. And obviously, um, there's a little bit more of, if you want to call it civic commitment, if you want to call it whatever. And I'd just like to echo what a number of other people have said. Um, on this microphone, I'd be willing to serve in any capacity necessary. Can you introduce yourself, Casey? My name is Casey Walsh. Thank you. Anyone else who hasn't spoken yet on this topic? Okay. So, in in summary, I I believe I've recognized, and this is something that stood out in Bill's memo, that a single site to drop in services, the the range of need is so great, and the receptivity to assistance is so great. I've been. Uh, touched by the folks that basically are surprised that anybody's even thinking about a way to provide services in a way that they can accept. Uh, the, the, the ability for very folks of varying temperaments and we need to create a lot of avenues for people to reach out to get the help that can be available. So this is a cross interdisciplinary cross, it's a very challenging design uh, process and I believe it's beyond a traditional government approach. There, there may be recommendations that come out of this task force that don't sit well uh, with traditional ways of thinking about it, but I think you should welcome that. I think that's what it's going to take to really create opportunity and hope in these folks. People are checking out for lack of hope and we need to do all we can, and it's gonna impact and overlap with affordable housing for these folks to step into. So in a nutshell, I've done my best to serve you up a Thank solution. Thank you. Yeah. I do have one question. I didn't understand in, in your memo, Bill, um, the bathroom thing, was that I, I don't understand the cost and the bath. Is that a renting? A yeah. So oh, one of the, one of the comments understand. that we heard at the last meeting when people talked about having to clean up feces yeah. and things in a public place, and we so even just in our group was like, well, where are there public bathrooms? And there are some here in City Hall, yeah. and, but really the only 24-hour one is in the police station. Yeah. And you know, for whatever reason, not everyone's comfortable going in there. So we thought, well, is that something the city could do at least seasonally? Is there a place we could put? You know, I mean, porta potties aren't the greatest thing, but they're better than nothing. And so, are there well, things we could do, or could we then yeah. plan to put a real bathroom? You know, could we think about where we could construct a bathroom? But it oh, was just okay. we were thinking about how, what are the kind of things we could do tomorrow that could help, and then think about a, a better long-term rate. Okay. So it was just that was a suggestion. Okay, because I, I read it like the person would have to pay to no, 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 no. Okay. That was just, we, just, we went in, so after the meeting, we just said, well, I wonder what it would cost to, to put oh, okay. something, you know, p portable bathrooms in, and that was the cost. So oh, okay. To the, presumably it, it to the city. fancy things with, with showers. Well, Thank you. That could be the next thing. Okay. So I see this as having three parts. Um, one part being how many people, or how many seats do we want to create? Do we want to reserve um, seats for a particular organizations or say, you know, we'd prefer to have at least, you know, um, one or two or however many um, people who have experienced homelessness um, uh, on the committee? And then a third thing would be um, just a quick outline of uh, the, the mission or the task that we're um, asking them to perform. Um, so thoughts about any of those things? Oh, Jack, I would suggest that I'm not, this is what I would make as a motion, just to keep 
Well, sure. Just, it, sure, you can. I, I move that we uh, create a task force uh, up to eight people that uh, the uh, city manager uh, be directed to uh, send out the requests for applications from uh, all the groups listed in uh, in his uh, memo and to all the people uh, who have either uh, been listed in Steve Whitaker's memo to us or who have otherwise already contacted the city to uh, express their interest, uh, including people who are here present, uh, and uh, that we get the application so that the uh, appointments would be made at the <coughs> next meeting. I second. Further discussion? Any thoughts on, on this? If not, we can just vote. But, okay. Going once, going twice. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you all um, and for, your, for all of your attention and thought, um, you know, going into this topic. So uh, it seems that, that it is a relatively quick turnaround um, to have it be on the agenda for the next meeting, So, which is fine. I just want to recognize that. And... Um, yeah, it's actually slightly less than that. Um, but, so yeah, because we have to have it done for the. But if you've already spoken to your people, and I think these, you know, the organizations, I think have been expressed a willingness, it probably, I bet we could get responses pretty quickly. Yeah. Great. And is there any? Uh, do we feel like there's pretty um, that the task of this group is clear enough um, based on this memo, or do you want to discuss that at all? discuss that I would ask to be heard again on it um, or just ask you to re re refine scope at the bottom of my memo. Uh, Don. I, I like the idea of the group starting from here mm -hmm. and then as they meet they can redefine their mission and, and task. Okay. Um, other thoughts on that? Okay. Um, so we'll assume that, that, that this memo is sort of the starting place. It does outline um, so broad um, scope tasks to look into and they can go from there. Okay, so f fair enough. Um, we are gonna move on um, at this point, unless there's any further discussion. Okay, so um, on to uh, discussion of um, uh, Central Vermont Internet and um, the CVPSA, Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. I think that's, that's you, Steve. If you are ready to come um, talk through the uh, memo you discussed. Okay. Uh, this is something, again, I've been asking for six months or more, ten, uh, for y'all to take up, that I believe that the both the CV Fiber, which it <coughs> voted to be called, uh, not Central Vermont Internet, uh, <coughs> and Central Vermont Public Safety Authority have a su sufficient need for direction and <coughs> engagement from the city council to uh, achieve results. Um, I spoke at your hearing in November, December, uh, and I shared a transcript of that. Um, the planning that CVPSA arrived at was obviously uh, not sufficiently detailed to create the buy-in from either Barry City or Montpelier City Councils. That has left the organization CVPSA uh, in somewhat of a uh, holding pattern or uh, almost rudderless at this point, lacking direction uh, of what to do in order to... Some of that is not the fault of CVPSA, but the result of certain actions needing to be clarified in the legislature, specifically related to the governance of the 911 system, the number of public safety answering points, the dispatch, single stage versus two stage dispatching. Um, the overlap, the technology overlap between what CV Fiber is aiming to do, which is build fiber to unserved areas 
and what CVPSA will need in the way of fiber to transmitters. There are currently gaps. I'm told that the fire trucks lose radio contact as they go up Berlin Hill and can't receive transmissions. That's downright dangerous. So we need a, a needs assessment of three technologies. There's the fiber that serves as backhaul to small cell for, for uh, telephone coverage, the fiber that serves as backhaul to radio transmitters, and the land mobile radio uh, transmission that is the radios that police and fire and ambulances use today. So the needs assessment is a logical step. I did convene a meeting, at, Bill convene, allowed me to convene a meeting, including him, uh, a week or two ago, uh, where Paco and a representative from CV, your, the, this city's alternate rep for CV Fiber, Ken Jones, very capable uh, analyst and uh, knows a lot about telecommunications now as well. Uh, Bill and uh, Kim Cheney joined that meeting. And it became clear in the course of that meeting that the logical next step is a needs assessment, which could serve as a foundation of a, in effect, a, a tel telecom plan for central Vermont or for the served areas. So I'm proposing that you direct your, your representatives to the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority and to the Central Vermont CV Fiber to request that they collaborate on getting CV Fiber is less far, farther less along than CVPSA. CVPSA does have some remaining money in the budget that belongs to both Barry and Montpelier. Um, that you direct your delegates, which is Donna and Ashley, to represent to CVPSA uh, the need or the direction to get that needs assessment done. Uh, but include all those technologies because they all affect public safety and they all will excel similarly accelerate the success of CV fiber and broadband. Is that clear enough? Questions? Uh, wow, I did a good job. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ashley? No? <laughs> okay. Well, I don't. <laughs> I have a little different perspective. Can you hear me? Uh, Steve, okay. Uh, I have to talk sort of this way in. And yeah, yeah it's me. okay. It's, it's really I strange. But just so the group knows that Regional Planning Safety Authority was, had put out the idea to do an RFI, Request for Information, to do a huge scope of communication like Stephen is talking. And there was a communication committee made up for people from the Public Safety Authority and Capital West. They came back and on the recommendation of that committee and Chief Focus, Focus uh, that we not do an RFI, but we face the reality that we have radios and that a radio simulcast system doing an RFP for that would go in and assess all the existing fire stations and offices and need and tell you what you need and, and make proposals. And because there's only two vendors that are applicable to our equipment, it's a rather narrow RFP, but they would do that as part of their response to addressing our system, rather than to spend money on uh, a separate person. So that's where we're at right now. Capital West has their communication committee looking at this. Tony is part of that. I, uh, Ashley? I would. Um, so, much to my chagrin, I'll give you that, Mr. Whitaker, I actually agree with you about this <laughs> uh, in its entirety. Uh, I, I actually had an opportunity to sit and, and talk with Stephen about this for quite some while, over a few days. Um, and uh, <coughs> while his delivery may be rough, um, he is definitely right about this. In terms of radio communications, you know, as a prosecutor, I'm on call, and when I get Barry Town calls, for example, it has to get routed through someone else to get to me, and then trying to get back in touch with officers who are out in the field who may not have cell coverage, 
or you know their computers might not even work out there even though they have satellite I, I don't purport to understand but they seem to work in lots of places where there is no other service available but there are still places where there is no service of any sort um, and uh, this is by far I think some of the most thoughtful partnership proposals that I've seen uh, and and I know that CVPSA went in one direction um, I, I think I was pretty vocal about my disappointment with where that went but I have been following uh, emails back and forth and um, I do I think this is a, a very sensical approach to take I mean the fact that I can't drive from Montpelier to Burlington and even have cell coverage the entire way is like unconscionable to me because I've driven across the country and and you know had better service in like the middle of nowhere um, and so I just um, I would encourage the the council to to really pay attention to this um, because there are some changes coming in the legislature also some changes coming um, in terms of federal regulation about communication uh, access and, and things like that so um, I would really encourage CVPSA I know Kim is here um, and uh, CV fiber to really uh, think strongly about how to make this work because I really do think that that this is one of the only ways that we'll ever get the right people in the right room at the right time working on the same thing so I know it's it's a deviation and a departure but um, I, I feel pretty strongly that this really is the way to get the information that we need to then be able to figure out if you know okay fine so we only really invest in emergency communication infrastructure for now but at least we know how other pieces would dovetail into that and it also uh, may be something that can be used as as a bigger plan elsewhere because other areas in the state are talking about this which may actually attract uh, vendors who may be willing to work in different ways uh, than they currently do so I, I just I think we should be very mindful that um, this really does bring in all of the the stakeholders to this conversation about communication and emergency response um, but it, it will assuming that everything comes together and works which I know is a, a large assumption assumption um, but I, I think there's a lot of opportunity here to get other people to come in who may be able to to do part of the work that CV, CVPSA or other individual entities may not but there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration and may I respond to Donna's um, sure yeah uh, the and I've tried to avoid getting into any of the dirty laundry of, uh, and I will continue to try to avoid that tonight. Uh, but the idea to jump from where we are now to a proposal to purchase a million, one to $2 million system that only serves part of the need is frankly absurd. That to go to, a, there was even talk of going with a monopoly vendor, a Mo Motorola simulcast system. Now, it's true that Motorola would design a fiber network to serve their simulcast towers. We would be missing the opportunity to also plan how that might most efficiently overlap and synergize with CV fiber and, and cellular coverage. So what I'm ta talking about is having a disinterested, comprehensive uh, foundation for a plan that once we get that plan, then we're ready to uh, in fact, the, our, the scope of this could include an assessment of Motorola's technology versus alternatives. So let me just caution that we, in, in my view, CVPSA, Capital West are in no place, form, or status to be uh, bonding one to two million dollars for a simulcast system until these pla this planning is done. Uh, Jack and then since much, part of what Donna had to say was that putting, uh, going your route would involve needlessly spending money on uh, this RFI and the planning process. Do you or does anyone have a estimate on what, what the cost would be of buying this uh, plan? Well, I, I, w I just want to make sure um, so 
my understanding of CVPSA, and Donna, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that's that was that was sort of where we had been was that the, that there was a communications committee who was figuring out who the potential vendors were, but I I guess I didn't read that as a disqualifier from from not staying the court. I can't. My words are gone, but. I mean, we were going to do the same thing Microtransit did. Microtransit went out and did an RFI mm -hmm. and got all these proposals to make right. the service work without right. us spending a dime on a consultant. Right. An RFI and a broad communication was what we were going to do, and we were working on that for about four months when mm -hmm. both chiefs said, no, mm -hmm. we don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. All of Capital West said, no, we don't want to do that. So right. we went back to the simulcast, something they could actually have. And so I just, I, and this is maybe a clarification question then. So, um, so I'm going to stop while I'm ahead because I'm not sure that I'm quite comprehending what you're saying. Okay. Well, let, can I respond to your? Well, uh, were you not comprehending what Jack I, was saying? I guess, or so my confusion is, so everyone agreed that that approach wasn't the approach. So it's, so my, what I, the impression I was left with on CVPSA is we're sort of Figuring out what is next is that, and so right now we're sort of. Well, I don't think we do. I mean, the answer either nothing is next if we don't have agreement about anything, or <laughs> it's the RFI from Motorola because they're the only ones who provide what we would need for this simulcast, or something different. RFP. Um. Yeah, go ahead, Donna. Well, uh, yeah. The RFI was the broad one that he's talking about. It was including cellular. It was including first, um, it's about first alert. First net. Yep. I'm sorry, first, first net. net. First net. It was looking at anything and everything. But and so, but and that would be for vendors was, to send to was, us, right? That was just going out there so vendors would come back with ideas mm -hmm. without any cost to us. Sure. And so I guess. blew it down and so did capital. Well, and so what I see this as is an opportunity to figure out exactly what it is that we already have so you know that I'm, I'm going to say let's pause for a second and unless there's anything further you want to Well, I guess it's just we'll I, I don't I didn't see it as like a, a, and a, you spend this money um, or do this other thing. I mean, the only other thing that I'm aware of as an option is is buying the simulcast framework that we would need to upgrade it, but that wouldn't really meet all of the needs, right? Am, Correct. Am, okay. Okay. So, okay. So I guess I guess that's what I was getting at, is that framing it in terms of, well, this is spending money right now, and, and the other alternative isn't, I guess, I just, I just want to clarify that it's not about, like, if we spend this, then we can't do that, but rather this I see as a precursor to getting to a place where we could even contemplate spending additional funds on infrastructure upgrade. I want to hear from Kim sure. and then, um, yeah, go ahead. Yes, I'm Kim Cheney, I'm chair of the CBPSA. This is a very complex subject. And the ask of you tonight is to direct CBPSA to do something, very simply. Um, we have three members. And, uh, and we have one elephant, and everybody has a different piece of it, and they all are very passionate about their piece of it. When we were here in December, we recommended a study, and I've got the the item here, and I'll just I've got three copies, and I'll just pass them around if anybody wants to read it. In December, nothing that I'm aware of has really changed from December. Um, candidly, I think I learned more about it meeting with uh, uh, Bill Fraser a couple of weeks ago when he told me that he'd met with the public safety people and they were all in disagreement about what they wanted and what they wanted to do. Um, and unfortunately, that's not new. 
That's been going on for the two or three years I've been on the commission. My response to this is to call a meeting for next week, and I hope I'm going to get all the all our members, which essentially are the people that we're going to have to come together with an idea, and see if we can't cut the Gordian knot, at least talk about where they want to go. Um, as I say, everybody has their own solution, and everybody has very different needs, and there's different funding sources, which are very complex. Um, CVPSA, when Paco resigned halfway through his contract, he left some money on the table. And we have approximately 50000 in funds. And we can either give it back, whatever it is, 53% to Barry and 47 to Montpelier, uh, or we can do something to further the mission of CVPSA. I'm a strong believer that, and oddly enough, all the public safety chiefs will tell you that they are strong believers in regional communication. When you ask them how they're going to do it, they all say they can't. Um, it's a long battle, and what I would suggest the moment, you know, before I give a suggestion, I'm happy to have this come before the council because as far as I can tell, <coughs> when we had the meeting in December, almost nobody had read the report that we sent or had even an inkling of what was in it. And I want both city councils to decide what they're going to do with what was a very potent and exciting idea until Barrytown and Berlin dropped out of it. And probably that made it a plan that wasn't going to go forward. I do think, though, that there is room to bring people together if we had a thorough study that would show all the various technological and other solutions that are available, and that we have some competent person that would do that. Paco told me that he was willing to come back to find a uh, person and recommend somebody that he thought was competent to do that. He gave an estimate that the planning cost was within the parameters of the money we have on hand. There is no use in spending money if everybody's going to come and tell me they don't want to do whatever you come up with. So the first steps are to meet with the people, see where they're at. They've kicked it around here now for the last three or four months, I think, with no clear idea where to go. And our, all we can do here is say we're, we're ready to help. And I, I want to talk to the chief. I know he's been on vacation and I'm sure quite busy. I did, I did talk to uh, <coughs> Chief Bombardier. Um, so I have some idea of where, where this is going and I'll know a lot better uh, after our meeting. Um, so where I would like to leave it is I'm delighted it's in front of you. I thank Steve for doing that uh, because it's at least opened up the door again to think about this. Uh, Barry's a whole different subject and I think when we've had our meeting, uh, I'll be in a position to talk to Barry. I've talked to the mayor. He says, well, tell me what my pillar is going to do, and we'll see what happens after that. So it's, it's uh, pulling teeth. 
the end story here is that it is absolutely vital for public safety that we agree on what to do and get doing it. There's possibilities of serious harm to our populations with the type of patched up communication system we have. And I think we all have an obligation to the people that we're all serving to plan ahead vigorously and lean on people to reach an agreement so somebody doesn't get badly hurt. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I have a question. Um, so, uh, Stephen, is this, what you're proposing here with a needs assessment, is that um, more or less the same thing as um, the RFI that was sort of discussed, you know, doing a broad scale sort of well, look at what's out there? The, the current debate, um, as I understand it, is Each separate, each of our members is an easy way to say it, Barry Montpelier and Cap West, uh, have suppliers that they think, vendors, that will tell them how to f meet their needs. Uh, Montpelier getting communications with a fire truck, which they don't have, or if they get in the pavilion office building, they can't talk with anybody. They're probably not terribly complex solutions to take care of those problems relay towers or whatever. Um, I think the, and Barry has exactly the same problem. Their fire chief can't even call the office because of the chatter on the, on the, uh, on the web. And there are solutions for Barry to <coughs> solve that problem. So let me just clarify. So I'm wondering, Stephen, if this is. I haven't seen the draft RFI. I okay. will note that the so called communications committee uh, has not responded with minutes of their prior meetings nor notice of any meetings since I requested months ago. So apparently that's dormant too. Yeah, I haven't seen any. And so yeah. my, my point is that I wouldn't characterize this as an RFI, but the, Paco's description of it as a needs assessment, uh, and I'm specifying that the needs assessment be conducted in a manner that could serve as a foundation for, for a full-on plan. It's not partial or preferential to any of Capital West's uh, uh, preferences or agenda nor Montpelier's, nor Barry's. It's a uniform. And one th important piece to add is that if this is done right and soon, it could serve as the, uh, the sweetener, the carrot, that could bring, bring to the fore the value of Berlin and Barry Town joining this thing. I, I think in the long run, Capital West will fade away as a member and the individual towns will join and begin contributing to this. In effect, what I'm proposing is a, you take action immediately. It's not doing anything. It's not binding any money that you've got discretion over right now. It's giving direction, which then I believe Barry City will follow suit and do the same and Capital West will produce a product which will lay a foundation to CVPSA becoming not a multi-town police or fire agency, nobody's ready to cede their authority, but it would be a communications uh, dispatch, public safety dispatch authority that could enable, uh, I believe Capital West will sell the two or three towers that they own and a system will, will grow to serve all the needs. I think it'll keep it alive and it will most importantly protect the hundreds of thousands of dollars that have been invested by Barry City and Montpelier. And otherwise, I believe, I fear we'll lose that. I have one further question, which is, um, Donna, did they, or Ashley, <coughs> um, did uh, the chiefs did, um, explain why they didn't want to go with uh, uh, an, RF, an RFI? Why they wanted to go directly to an RFP? What they said was it was just too expensive, there was no money. And they, reason, right before that, they had two fires 
for the chiefs lost communication with the farm people in the farm. They had to go inside the building to find out where their crew was. That's how bad the communication system is. And so they were really looking to be more practical. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's, it, no. It, so there are two separate communication systems for fire and police. Yep. Police is far, much further along than fire. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And so, but the fact of it was that made them think they really needed to get realistic because a simulcast would help them now. And they can build on that to go the next step. Um, uh, Jack, you had a question. I, I'm just a little confused on how to proceed because you know, this council has resided its trust in two very able and perspicacious representatives who are taking uh, different views and both seem to make. Uh, very good points, and so I'm kind of confused about where to go. Why? It sounds like you're saying, Donna, that what the chiefs are asking for now is the only realistic and practicable way to proceed. Oops. Can I talk about this on there? No, if you want an RFI, then get, get a big scope, fine. But don't spend the last pennies we have on a consultant to then do a need assessment when you can do an RFI and get it done within a proposal uh, or the RFP. But that's my thing. I don't want to spend money on a consultant. Let me just say I disagree with that. I know you do. So. And can I, uh, I believe I that, be oh. Yeah, go ahead. And Kim White. Because the conflict in ideas and technology and understanding of it is pretty widespread. And I think if you get one person that pe people have to buy into it, but if you get one person or firm or whoever that takes a look at the whole thing and makes recommendations, I think it'll pull people together. And Frankly, uh, we had some off-the-wall price discussions in December, figuring simulcast would run a million dollars or s some number like that. Simulcast isn't going to solve everybody's problems. But I'm not interested, uh, and I doubt anybody in this room wants to run a large bond issue simply with, with no bid and some manufacturer comes in and says they'll build it. I would think you would want to have the recommendation of a trusted person to say, this is what will work for everybody and these are the various costs and this is who it will serve. And at that point we can figure out uh, do we want to do it or don't we. Unless, Steve, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I, I think that an RFI in response issued by police agencies is not going to gain you your efficiency, your economy of uh, synthesizing the small cell, the neutral host small cell, to fill the gaps where the cell towers don't get with the potential to accelerate community broadband. That's, that's beyond the scope that CVPSA of its own accord will put out an RFI for. So this is basically asking the city, who's a member of both Capital West and CV Fiber and CVPSA, to say, we want to you to explore and demonstrate the economy of that, that efficiency of that approach. So Steve said in a far more technical way, what I was about to say, which is I think the, the piece that's missing and we, we haven't really talked about is the opportunity or the idea of bringing CV fiber into this too because you get a separate group that wants to raise money to bring fiber all through central Vermont for cable and that kind of thing. And and rather than looking at, and, and which can also be used for public safety communications. And so how do you coordinate those efforts so maybe, you know, we don't want to build two fiber lines and, you know, pay for it twice. 
and, and get the synergy. And I think, you know, I, I have to say, um, and I'm no expert in this, and I'm somewhat late to the conversation, but as I've, I've tried to learn more about it, um, you know, I, th I think that, right, a public safety consultant is going to look at the public safety needs. I'm not, and, and I do believe it's even more complex even the fix for fire, as I'm understanding, isn't as easy as I thought it even might be. But, you know, police run digital radios, fire doesn't, and you've got, you know, in, in, and they rely on the mutual aid for all around. So unless all these small towns switch to digital, which, you know, I mean, it, there's a lot more to it than I think we understand. A week from Friday, I'm, I and all the public safety people in Barry, Montpelier, and the other, the city manager are going to have our follow-up conversation, and I certainly... I got mixed reactions on the simulcast, whether that was really what people wanted from the people in that room. So, and was it was that a real benefit to the cities, or was that more of a benefit to the smaller towns? So, I, you know, I'm I'm still there. So, I don't know whether it's an RFI. I don't know if it's a, you know I don't know the mechanism, but I think the, the, the I support the sentiment here, which is at least urge our representatives on these boards to find the best way to integrate the services so that we're, we're, we're you know, it, it so happens we're gonna be building them both out at the same time, just by luck of timing. So let's not blow it. That's, you know, let's maximize the benefit. Uh, Donna, I mean, Center for Vermont Fiber can be part of that RFI. I mean, I was so impressed with the microtransit, how many vendors they came out, and then they came and visited. I mean, we learned so much. It was just amazing. And then you make that decision, and then you hire somebody to implement it and make it happen. But that's yeah. Well, I, I, like I said, I'm not I, I, yeah, so much different. I mean, an RFI is so much different than an RFP. It's just amazing. I was so impressed. I think you need a plan before you can put. So, yeah. Fair enough. Um, other thoughts? What um, would you like to do, team? Bill, I. Could I just, I, I can't hear you very well. Your okay. microphone is a little Yours little is different. low frequency. It's really inaudible, um, nearly. But what was the bottom line that you support a plan? Yes, my or? suggestion was that, I, you know, I, like I said, I don't know the best mechanism. You know, I, all things being equal, I tend to lean toward a consultant, but that's without having studied all the alternatives. I, I hear the merit in the RFI, but I think the proposal before you is urge our representatives on CV Fiber and our representatives on CVPS. We can't tell either of those boards what to do. All we can say is we urge right. you to find the best way to work together and decide yourselves whether it's an RFI or a consultant or whatever it might be. We, you know, I, I think if we start dictating the means and methods, we're going to get way out over our skis. But I think just saying, going on record saying we'd like to see a holistic approach between the two of you, I think, would be a good statement from the city. That's my take. That makes sense to me. Um, you know, leave it to the two groups to figure out how to coordinate, but just recognizing that there's this really unique opportunity um, to collaborate uh, and, and to think broadly about um, the needs before the, uh, before the, the CVPSA. Um, is and it there has three-month reporting thresholds in the language. Mm -hmm. For you to get reports back from both CV Fiber and CV PSA in three months. Is there a motion that uh, could be made to that effect? Or unless an interview is not there, and that's okay too, but. I just don't know if it's appropriate for me to move it if I'm the council member. <laughs> You're the rep. Urge, urge yourself to do something. It just f it feels wrong, but I'd be happy to do it. <laughs> I don't think it. Hurts. I don't know that it violates any rules, it just feels weird. You could, you could move that instead of directing the, the reps to do that, you could say the city council supports, supports this uh, a cooperative effort between CV Fiber and CV PSA, PSA and urges the two boards I've to certainly heard that. cooperate. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do, do well, we even I, need so a motion? So I, I, I really am struggling with the way these meetings are scheduled because I don't have the bandwidth to keep up with 30 emails a day about timing. And it, I'm, I think I sent an email to everybody requesting doodle polls because like, I have a full-time day job and I'm on call. And I, 
And calling in in every other context is at least an option on occasion. And so I totally appreciate that I haven't been there, but I have to work. I have medical providers I have to see, and I can't, I can't read 30 emails a day to figure out when a meeting is going to be. I think probably we should probably have a motion if we're going to do if we're Sure. What was your word in there, Bill? <laughs> I've already come out of my brain. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I can't think twice. I think the I th All right. I would say that um, the, the city council of Montpelier wants to go on record as supporting a cooperative effort between CV Fiber and CV PSA to look at a regional-wide communications network uh, that you know, uses the fiber structure in its most efficient means and, or, you know, urges the two groups mm -hmm. to work together cooperatively to accomplish that goal. I Couldn't have said it better really myself, Bill. Yes, that's you my could. motion. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. but I think that's a little narrow. There is first net. CV fiber is only one player. There's first net. Well, CV, so I would say and other fiber providers. Fiber. Right? Well, well, that was and other communications providers. So, uh, yes. Connor, is that... Is that okay yeah, with you? That's great. Okay. Okay, making it sort of broad, like that. Okay. Kind of um. a broad idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, so what I understand is that Connor just made that motion. Yes. I'm seconding it. <laughs> okay. Great. Is um, there a further discussion? Uh, all, okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And thank mm -hmm. you for bringing this to our, our attention. I think thank this you. is a great thank opportunity. You for your Yep, for sure. <laughs> okay, all right. I am hopeful still that we're going to get out of here at ten. I'm just going to say that. Um, chapter seven, the ordinances. So you're opening the. Oh yes. Yeah, so uh, we're going to open. Um, uh, is this this is the second public yes. hearing? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yes. I don't know where I was from the first one. Okay, um, so I'm going to open the second public hearing um, on Chapter 7. Any comments on Chapter 7? My comment is that we're yes, all Jack. happy with it on July 10th, and I am still happy with it. So as soon as we close the public hearing, I'll move in the uh, Donna? It's just so refreshing to see it reduced and getting concentrated. <laughs> This is great. Thanks, staff. Jamie, whoever did it. Okay, I'm going to be a pain and say that I have some comments. Um, <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. Um, are we, so, okay. Uh, 7, 400, D and E. Uh, have we made garbage the equivalent of recyclables? See if oh. I can. Their their definitions are basically the same, um, and then it becomes relevant again in seven four zero one. Um, the title says vehicles carrying garbage or trash, but I th but we just took out the definition for trash, so perhaps that should say garbage or recyclables. Um. Um, oh. Yes. Oh. I just the definition of recyclable. That's not right. Yeah, I, I. That felt a little funny. I was like, that's the definition of garbage, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which may well be in practice what is happening because no one overseas is buying our recyclables anymore. But yeah. <laughs> Right, exactly. Practically speaking, that practically maybe, speaking, that may be what's true. happening. But I would assume that we, as a city, don't want to define recyclables yeah. the same as we do trash. I apologize that I did not catch the, these things the first time through. There's also going to be, you know, in, as noted in the um, cover sheet, there's going to be some changes coming um, based on state law and composting and amendments to Chapter Three regarding toxic chemicals. So we may need to come back to this chapter at some point anyway. Fair enough. I'm happy to make these changes now with the flag that maybe we can revisit it. Um, I have one other thing, which is I just didn't. Mm, okay, in seven two, that's kind of going backwards a bit, but um, they use the word swell, and I'm just unfamiliar with that as a 
garbage related term. Like awful. And, awful. Well, awful. awful. And, but then, at least that's like um, near it in that sentence, I think, but I didn't know what a swell was. Mm -hmm. 7 2, you said? So, yes, yeah, 7. Any swell house awful? Uh, yeah, the new 7-2, surface deposits of offensive or unhealthful materials. It's right in that first sentence. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, it is in the first sentence. Any swell. Could it, could it be meant to be swill? Not that that's I don't know. all that much To clearer. become larger and rounder than usual. <laughs> to cause to increase in size. I just looked up the de like all the definitions of swell, swell I and none of them made sense. Okay. So, in any case, that's, um, I just want to... I, I think that might be appropriate there. Like, if stuff, like, spreads outside. I mean, it's not how I would use it, yeah. but I'm a, based on all of the, the older sure. context. It's well, why don't we take a look at it before we have to revisit this again? Yeah, okay. Um, again, I'm happy to, to approve this with the changes for now and knowing that we're going to come back to it. Just uh, checking yeah, in, do you, do you have a suggestion for how to change the definition of recyclable? Nope, I don't. I think we should revisit it then. We, you think we should what? Uh, send it back and bring See, it Before up. we approve it? Yes. So maybe we're not necessarily like approving it into. No, that's good. That, it certainly seems a, like a good thing to have a definition of. Uh, so having a, another hearing on chapter seven then? Um, Okay. Um, for that, for that matter, then I in seven one, I was a little worried that we were banning the, the possibility of worm casting boxes. You know, sometimes people compost inside their homes. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't preventing that from happening. Are uh, worm casting boxes government sanctioned? Is that? Covered under that last. I don't phrase. know. Yeah. Um, Jamie tells me that uh, she has the definition of recyclables, by the way. But in any case, um, sounds like maybe we're going to have a, another hearing on this. Yeah. And that's fine. Okay. Um, so, any comments on, from the public on this chapter? Okay. So, I'm going to close the public hearing. And I think we're probably setting another public hearing for this one. Next meeting. Um, at the next meeting. Um, oh, actually, I think we need a motion to that effect, though. So moved. Oh. Great. <laughs> Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? OK. Thank you all. All right, so we have an, um, an update on protests from uh, uh, Captain Martell. Yeah, great. Welcome. I want to get your title right. Good evening. Um, so, uh, recently, myself and some of the department heads, specifically Tom McCardle from Public Works and Bob Gallants from the Fire Department, uh, got together along with Sue from the City Manager's Office to discuss. Yeah, better. To, to discuss the ongoing concerns that have been expressed uh, with the recent protests. We've had two this summer that have been disruptive to different parts of the downtown area, uh, specifically uh, back in July at uh, State and Taylor and near the State House, and then uh, a week or so ago right at State and Main. I think you still need to be closer to the Better? <laughs> okay. Um, so um, we've received lots of different feedback uh, from citizens, business owners, um, and people that frequent Montpelier. Uh, some of it has gone both ways, to be quite honest. We've seen a significant amount of frustration from people that are trying to uh, travel through the city that were upset by these uh, protests and disruptions. Um, my thought was um, to get other department heads on board with trying to understand what our ability to respond and what our assets and resources are at the police department. Uh, on any given day, there's not more than three, maybe four officers working. Uh, these protests, the most recent one, probably had in upwards of 30 youth in various ages from f maybe as young as 13 up 
to probably early 20s. The earlier July protest had um, active protesters in the street somewhere in the neighborhood of probably 15 to 20. Um, so when you do the simple math there, it's not a good number of officers to protesters. I'm not saying that these protesters are violent or have a propensity to become violent, but they are committing some act of civil disobedience by blocking the roadway. So um, if I have uh, this past Friday, for instance, it was myself. I was fortunate I had three other officers and a detective available. Uh, we met with that group, tried to understand what their intent was, the duration not really negotiating, but there is a negotiation that has to occur with these people to understand what they're trying to accomplish and for us to express what we have to do as, you know, the police and to keep the streets open. Um, it's give and take. I'll be honest with you. You have to assess the situation from our standpoint of what we can feasibly do with three to four police officers and somewhere between any given time, 15 to we've seen protests that have probably up to 100 people. Um, what it comes down to from the police perspective is what assets, what officers can I quickly bring to the area to facilitate removal. We can ask for compliance. We can order for compliance. If they refuse to comply, then we have to, basically it's riders refusing to leave. When they're blocking the street, it constitutes what is disorderly conduct by state statutes when you impede vehicular or pedestrian access thoroughfare. Um, to be clear, these are misdemeanor crimes that you, yes, you arrest in Vermont, but you cite and release for misdemeanor crimes unless there's other applicable rules under Rule 3, which continuation of offense could be one of those. But typically, these people would be asked to leave and then escorted from the roadway, issued a citation to appear at court and or go through a restorative process if that's deemed the most appropriate action. And you know, it, it moves forward from there. Typically, we don't physically drag people away, but we have had instances of protests where we have had to, and that even a passive resistance changes things from a law enforcement perspective. If, if a person is compliant, usually it's a one-on-one -on -one situation. If a person becomes passively non-compliant, it then, for the safety of the officers and the safety of the protester or the disobedient person, it requires no less than three suggested four officers if they have to physically drag, for lack of a more carry, carry drag, yeah, remove um, that person. So you've now, you know, taken what might have been, you know, three or four officers handling several people to now three or four officers dealing with one person in particular. So um, what I asked for the other department heads was to be at the ready to the best of their abilities, understanding each of those, the fire and, and DPW have other core tasks, uh, but to be at the ready if I call specifically with public works to provide barricades, cones, roadblocks, and personnel to deter traffic, which we have been dedicating law enforcement officers to, which if we're going to have to arrest these people takes the few officers that I have working, they're now stuck directing traffic around the scene. Um, so I could free them up with use of other city department people. Understanding fire department is not part of their core mission, but if they, they have officers or, or firefighters available. Um, I've reached out to other assets. The chief is speaking or will be speaking with area chiefs in Washington County about being able to provide assets. The reality is every situation is different, but most departments are in the same situation. If I call for Barry, I'm going to get maybe one officer, maybe two. I called state police at the last protest. They had three, three troopers, including the sergeant, and two troopers covering all of Washington County on a Friday. So the reality is there's not this magic pool of officers working in any given community in central Vermont. Um, with planning, and if we know that these protests are coming, we can ramp up our staffing. We can reach out to other area agencies beyond Washington County and, and other agencies can plan and and have resources available. Uh, the last two, I gotta be quite honest, we had very little warning. Actually Friday, uh, the last one at, at State and Maine, we had no warning, we had no intel at all that they were going to take to the street, they just did it. Um, so that that is tough to plan for, obviously, when you don't know this. We do know, the group has made it known to us, and through their social media sites, that they are planning to ramp up this process of protest. Specifically, September 20th through the 27th has been targeted as a worldwide time period for um, protests that 
you know, I, I'm sure most of you have probably seen or heard, but it, it centers around fossil fuels and climate change and all the concerns that they have. What makes it a little more complicated is this is a youth-based movement, um, and it's not complicated that it's youth per se, but if it comes time to have to cite or arrest these youth, it's a little bit of a game changer from our perspective of how we handle anyone that's considered a youthful offender which is now anyone under the age of 18, uh, it's going to mean that it's going to tie up more resources for us under statutory law. We're required if we take one of those youthful offenders into custody that we turn them over to a guardian. If this is a destination location for people all over the state, mom and dad aren't going to be working down at DMV. They're going to be at all corners of the state, which is going to tie up additional resources, kind of for lack of a a better term, holding on or babysitting these kids until we can turn them over to a guardian or parent. So uh, something to be aware that this action plan coming together is youth-based. Uh, I anticipate that it will be youth from all over the state and perhaps beyond. So uh, we, we are starting to uh, plan for this September time period, knowing that uh, they've identified September 20th through the 27th as a key national and worldwide time to uh, call to action. They've also indicated that there'll be more frequent pop-up events uh, any time between then and now. So my understanding is um, you, that you are sort of looking for um, you, some kind of clarity from the council about, uh, you know, what happened, the uh, generally speaking the approach like should we be arresting people or not or um do you want to um, i'll turn it back over to you yeah it, 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 yeah i mean i think i think we have to make a decision based on the totality of the circumstances and what we have for resources at the time and 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 the general public says get these people out of the street now and the reality is we may not disagree with that but we have to do it with the with enough resources so it can be safely done. And that takes time, unfortunately. Uh, the city certainly can offer a position on what the council or the city feels is appropriate. Um, do we want, as a community or as a city, endorse this type of behavior or, or protest? Or do we want to take a position that it, the streets have intentions for thoroughfare travel and not protest? Well, I guess I'll just speak for myself and say that I um trust the judgment of the department to evaluate um, you know on a situation by situation basis what is most needed um, you know I think it was uh, the, the, the way the last most most recent protest was handled was uh, was great um, in in that uh, you know that working together with the protesters um, uh, you know, did not result in arrests and uh, and it was and, and ultimately, um, you know, the, they were moved out of the street um, in, in time. And uh, the, I realize that that's an inconvenience um, for people traveling, um, but there's, there are some trade-offs there. And I, I, I'll speak for myself and say that feels, um, that felt acceptable. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm glad to hear that uh, DPW is on board in terms of, you know, if, if you make a call like, hey, we need some people to come out, set up cones, that's, I think that's ideal. And the other piece that I would highlight, I mean, I was watching social media, I was getting phone calls, text messages, emails, um, and, and I would just highlight to everybody that uh, these protests are an annoyance. Yes, like it's frustrating that it's going to take forever to get where you need to go. It can create, um, you know, potentially dangerous situations if we can't get emergency vehicles through or whatever. But that's kind of the point. And I would hate for, for all of us to forget that these actions have a purpose. And, you know, the inconvenience that may be experienced for the afternoon that this happens sucks. Um, let's just be real. It does. It's it's uncomfortable. It's unpleasant. There is nothing worse than it taking forty minutes to get home. You know, from from some point out other than Montpelier to to get back here. But on the flip side, you know, I'm thirty four years old. You know, maybe what 
a third halfway through my life at this point. And, and the folks who are out there in the streets who are showing up and, and putting up are going to be the ones that are going to be filling our seats and our shoes in the future. And um, I love that, uh, Captain, that you, you know, sort of talked about, like, we really need to be mindful about, like, they have the right to do this, you know. And, um, and it sounds like, based on conversations with other department heads and, and ways to handle that, you know, I think if that were solidified in terms of like a, a policy, like you know, when unannounced protests happen, you know, here are the here are the departments to call for what resources, for what services. Obviously, police are in charge of that, but um, you know, I think the other important piece as a council that we have to keep messaging is that yeah, this is uncomfortable, and we have an obligation to keep our city safe, but we also have an obligation to protect people who are out there doing work that they view is similar to what we're doing. They're advocating for the for the things that they believe in. And frankly, you know, fossil fuels are going to have an impact on all of us. Um, and so what I don't want this to, to be is sort of not seeing the forest for the trees. So I love that there's already been communications um, and if we can get those firmed up into a policy. But I also want to be very clear to people that, you know, we are the state capital and it is incumbent upon all of us to, to be aware that you know, politics impacts every single aspect of our lives. And, you know, kids, like at 13 years old, I was not out marching in the streets. I was probably sitting on my butt playing video games and eating Cheetos, you know, but, but it's important that young people are active and engaged and that people are showing up to talk about this and that we are able because we have, you know, we have officers out there, we have DPW and other city employees responding. Um, you know, that, that these be as successful as they can be, both in terms of messaging for them, whatever the message is, but also in terms of public safety and also our, re, you know, re, reaffirming our commitment to civil disobedience to change things. I think one of the goals of having this conversation today from a staff perspective was to outline the challenges, as, as Captain said, you know, what the re actual resources are, what it actually takes to sort of, you know, round them all up. And I think we got a lot of feedback from places. And again, some people, you know, a lot of complimentary saying we appreciate the way you handle it, but certainly from some residents and business owners saying, you know, I can't just stand in the middle of the street, you know, arrest them all, get them all out of there. What's, you know, what's, how come you're just letting them do this? They're breaking the law. And, you know, I, I wasn't here for the last one, but certainly I was on site for, for the one before. And that particular group was reasonable and peaceful. And they said, we'll be out by a certain time. And they actually were gone you know, a little bit before then. But, you know, you also, not everyone's is cooperative, cooperative. And I think, the, you know, the, the police have to be able to work with what they're dealing with. But a lot of this is to, to help you all and the public who's listening and watching understand it's not as easy as one might think to just round up a bunch of 30 or 40 people, arrest them. Uh, it's And that means they all have to be processes. That means they all go through right, the court system or the prosecuting system, and is that really the best use of the criminal justice system and everything else if we can peacefully resolve the situation? Uh, and, you know, people get belligerent, people get, you know, if safety becomes an issue, then by all means, that's the top priority. And, you know, I, I'll speak for just myself. I, at the first one, you know, for example, I never had any doubt in my mind that if a fire truck had to come down State Street, that they wouldn't have moved for it. Like, sorry, they would, they would not have. have? Would have. Th they th would they have. Would, yes, that they would have moved. Yeah. Like, there was there was no, they weren't going to lie down in front of the fire truck. Have there been other groups that might not yeah. do that? Then I think you have to handle those differently. You know, we, we have to think about all the other responses that we have to the community, including the business interests. And I, and I realize sometimes the protesters don't care about the business interests, but we have to think about all of it. So, Connor, and then Glenn. <coughs> I think uh, as a union organizer, this is a bit of a tough one for me. I'm usually on the other side of the protest line, but um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's probably more more than public safety. It's more than the inconvenience of businesses. I, I heard from a few folks who are actually hourly workers in town who lost a paycheck that day, you know, and that's a very real and immediate thing for them and their families. Right. Um, so I think again, taking the approach where we respect their rights, you know. Uh, we want to be accommodating to give them um, an outlet to express those views. I, I, I think they're very right as far as climate change being probably the greatest threat to our existence. Um, 
but, but at the same time, it did feel like the first one uh, went on a bit too long. And it's very helpful to have this conversation, knowing the limitation of our resources to do that. And one other thing to keep in mind is sometimes the end game in this is to get arrested, right? Uh, so let's be cognizant of that as well. Well, and actually, a lot of times, the, you know, I've seen it. The police ask them if they want to get arrested. And there are actually, you know, there's some that, fine, will cooperatively get arrested. But then there's others that won't. And so you just never know who you're dealing with. I think the frustrating part for the community and for the police, I'm trying to prevent Neil from having to answer all these questions, is we, we are very active at saying we'll give you this part of the street and we'll give you this sidewalk. Or, of course, there's always the State House lawn, which is sort of built for public you know, assembly and even the front of the city hall. And, and you know, <coughs> the flip side is, the, no, no, we want to block the traffic. We want to be in the street. We want to be disruptive. And it's like, you could, can't you make your point? You know, as, as one person posted, I think, on social media, it's like, oh, they're, they're worried about climate change and we're all stacked up in idling cars because we can't get through. So how is that, you know? So I think it's, it's, a, it's just a hard thing. And I, I admire the patience sometimes that the police have with, with this. Um, Glenn. Um, I like the way that the police has uh, handled the protest so far. Uh, I'm generally in sympathy with the goals of the protesters that I've seen, and I think that it is interesting to uh, see the, the growing movement here and around the world on this. Um, what I hear you saying, Captain Martell, is that sometimes, um, for example, going ahead and trying to arrest everyone who's in the streets would be a slower way to clear the street than uh, talking with the protesters and trying to work out a way that avoids arrests, especially, for example, if once you have arrested those 13 and 15 year olds, you then have to drive them to Brattleboro or wherever. At the very least, we're, we're going to hold on to them until we can reach a guardian or a parent that will say, do X, Y, or Z, or, or come claim them. Yes, so I guess I really appreciate that, and I, I think I would, um, As much sympathy as I have for the protesters, I think that it makes sense that the police's job and the, the city's job is to keep the streets clear right. for movement, um, and that you should do that job uh, the best way you can. And, and I, I can see that you have better ideas how that should work than, than I do, at least. So thank you. I, I mean, I'll, it, it, it is a negotiation session. In all honesty, it, it's try to achieve what they want to achieve and what we need to achieve and come to a somewhat happy medium between the two. That's essentially what we did with them when they took over state Maine. It, it, at that time of day, with that volume of traffic, I'm like, this is not going to work because they wanted it for an hour and a half or two hours. And I said, you know, what can we do to resolve this? You can't stay here. You know, it's the old, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here anymore. <laughs> uh, so, so through discussions, and, and Sue Allen was there as well, we negotiated that they would march to the Capitol. We would give them the road. We would assist them to get there. But they had to get out of the intersection. They had the intersection for about a half hour. And then they, you know, so there was some compromise. It's a lot like uh, a marriage, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also am curious. I mean, it sounds like there are general plans and no specific plans shared with the city or police. Is there any, for example, can we ask people to go through the formal process of shutting down a street with our approval? We can ask. Obviously, there's that process. I think that kind of that circumvents what their plan is. It is called uh, civil disobedience. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, they're very well organized. I mean, be, to be clear, they have trainings on a frequent basis. They have meetings at least monthly. And they're, if you follow their social media, they're having meetings weekly now to, to rally support, to, to, to spread their, you know, what they think is important and, and to organize. And, and our experience has been not so much with this group, but most of the groups are very similar and, and they have some crossover people. They, they have predetermined people that will do X, Y, and Z. They always have liaisons to law enforcement that will speak, so I'm not communicating or we're not communicating with multiple people. 
uh, they're organized, but they don't claim to have a hierarchy in the organization. It's a consensus decision on whether they'll move or not, and that liaison communicates back and forth with the group to obtain consensus. But they do have organizational structure. They use the group as kind of a cover for that, and but they're fairly well organized, and, and they have planned in advance of what their actions will be most of the time. Donna. I have just one concern. So far, everyone seems to agree with the protesting issues, and my concern is that when we have the groups that maybe aren't so agreeable to our ideas, that we treat them the same. And hence, the more you have that written down and clear policy procedures, and I think the safer we are to be treating everybody fairly. Yeah, it's a valid concern. If you, even with the same group, if you give them two sets of rules on two separate occasions, it sends very mixed messages. So, I mean, saying that, but also understanding that every situation is somewhat different. The location is different. The time of day could be different. The number of available officers, there's a lot of different things that have to be taken into consideration before making your final determination. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Any other uh, and we're going, if we're going f f a little back in time now, but there was, you know, 10 years or so ago, we had two different visits from the Westboro Baptist Church. And for those who are here, we provided the same protection for them and worked with them at where you're going to be and what you're going to disrupt and that kind of thing. And in, a, in that case, it was the counter protesters that we had to manage more so, you know, mm -hmm. um, because there was bigger crowds opposing them than they were actually there. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, any further questions? Thank you for the update, and okay. we'll just see how it goes. Cool. Okay, last item. We have 10 minutes. I don't think we're going to make 10 o'clock, team. Yeah. But Depends how fast you go. I know, exactly. Uh, all right, so um, review of the strategic outcomes from 2018, 2019. Well, I was going to go through each one <laughs> <Just> <laughs> individually, individually and discuss. <laughs> I think this should only <laughs> take about an hour and a half. Format. I had a terrible time reading it. Instead. Well, so I, I, what I was going to say very briefly, actually, is you've got a lot of data here, and part of it is you know your feedback, which I, we don't have to get tonight, but feel free to talk to me individually. Um, but as you know, this is our first this was from last year, so it was our first year with the new strategic plan format, the first year using the Invisio software. And, you know, we we now have a second, a newer strategic plan, and we are trying to improve our use of the system from what we've learned. And our goal is to get some pretty regular reports to you. If you recall, one of the items in this year's plan was a check-in every couple of months about how we're doing. So we thought we should at least start with how we finished up last year uh, is, is a good launching point. Uh, and we will seek to condense this information, but it, it is all here if anyone wants to read through it, um, and it, it's automated. And like I said, we will, uh, you know, I don't think we need to spend a lot more time on it unless there was anything of substance that people had. But we, we did do it, and we want to make sure you saw how we did. Um, is this the kind of thing that we would get, like in, in this form? Something um, like it. Okay, something like it. But we, it may we, it may we hopefully change. A little more concise. Okay, it may also be helpful to you know between one update and the next to um, if there was a way to see. I mean, part of it might just be like getting used to the format, but um, being able to see easily. Okay, so this part has changed. This part has not, you know, and um, for that kind of quick comparison, yep. just gonna put that out there. Jack, do you have a thought? Yeah, um, I don't want to go into great detail, but uh, as an overall question, I'm kind of curious about the methodology. So, how is it determined, for instance, that 72.73 percent? <laughs> of a particular goal is uh, on track and 27.27% of the goal is completed. So the, the, the overall goal is calculated through the software based on how the, the, the activities have been rated. So the activities are rated by the, you know, there's a responsible person for each activity. And, you know, to some extent there's a, a bit of our, you know, okay, or, you know, if it's done, it's done, it's 100%. Yeah. But, you know, a little bit as well. We've done this and this, we're about halfway through, so we'd estimate we're halfway through. If it's a construction project, it's a little easier. 
Uh, then there's some, you know, we have some in there like reduce op opioids. Well, you're either zero or 100. I mean, like there's no, there's no percentage you can apply to that. But the, the overall goal then takes all the, the composite of all the, the, the items in it and calculates it and says that's. Other questions about this? Uh, Don. I like the second half. It starts out of the cover page that has September 2019 on it. And it has those colored bars on track, progress, right there, real clear. Mm -hmm. That, that, I guess I could pick out mm -hmm. some things yeah. and start focusing in. Whereas the first half is just <coughs> words. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I Good. got lost. <laughs> really. But, yeah. Okay. Any other comments on this? Uh, yeah. It was a lot of information to try to plow through, and I would ask you to consider uh, what other format can make that available for review and comment by the public. Uh, I know that I might suggest, you know, there's an Acrobat for a PDF format, some of which where people could put comments in, maybe have that on the web and, and a place under each page where you could take some comments because it's going to be too laborious to go through such a document. But I found some things highly suspect about the progress towards affordable housing because, you know. Well, so again, the issue is, yeah, and I agree with that to the point that it, it's going to calculate the specific tasks. You know, the, the goal of accomplishing affordable housing, it, it's going to come out, you know, the council laid out, we're going to get four things done this year or whatever they were. And if those were all done, it might say that we did 100%, but it really just means we did 100% of what we set out to do this year. So I, okay. there is some nuance there, you know, so and you've got to. Can that context be right. at the head of, of those pages? So we are, like I said, we, this was our first time through. We, sure. It's a good tool. It's really an internal tool. We're trying to figure out how to do the best reporting, and it does have a live um, dashboard yeah. on the right. website that people can follow at any time or at certain update times or something like that. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, so moving on to council reports. Uh, I'm going to start over with Jack if you're ready. I am not ready. Okay, just kidding. Who is ready? Donna, go ahead. Well, I wanted you to know that two committees are taking Ordinance 10 very seriously, not only for skateboards, but also oh. for bicycles yeah. and for e scooters and e bikes, and that is both the Complete Streets and the MTIC. I really am looking at that. Really interesting discussion on that. Thank you. And the other thing is, uh, we're getting some data from on bikes and pets. People have asked what our numbers are from the Regional Planning Commission. They have cameras they'll put out, and they haven't done any for us for a while. So I've asked them, and I'll let you know if and when it gets done. Great, uh, Connor. Yeah, all right. Just thanks to the city staff for uh, mediating the uh, motorcyclists and uh, farmers last weekend. It seems like it was a marriage made in heaven, so uh, <laughs> thanks for doing that. <laughs> Glenn. Um, uh, I, yeah, gosh, I feel like I, I have all kinds of general thoughts and no specific thoughts, so maybe I'll just hold it to tomorrow morning at Baguito's 8.30 to 9.30. Um, oh, and just one other thing that I've really been enjoying walking around the city this season uh, with no snow and beautiful weather, and uh, I have been very much looking forward to the uh, pedestrian and bike bridge over the North Branch and really uh, appreciating the progress that I see there. There's a, there's a beautiful uh, robin's egg blue uh, excavator right there now that my four-year-old nephew uh, appreciated very much um, and they're putting in curbs it's great you should all go down to the side of the drawing board and watch the, the progress at that spot great uh, Ashley or Jack um, pass I was looking for the details and I'm not finding them but I wanted to point out to anyone who's available that I think it's tomorrow and Friday that uh, the, there's going to be work uh, putting in the uh, rain garden over at the uh, State Employees Credit Union. Mm -hmm. And anyone who um, is available to spend some time uh, on a beautiful day digging in the dirt, 
their uh, efforts will be uh, welcome to do that. Uh, I just want to um, highlight that uh, we have um, had some public hearings recently um, and want to thank people for coming out to those public hearings about the transportation uh, or uh, the um, uh, traffic changes of Berry Street and Main Street. Uh, lots of great input on that, a really interesting conversation. Um, and then, uh, and then also uh, thanking the realtors for coming out to that to the public hearing there about the um, energy um, ordinance. And then we just want to highlight again that we have another public hearing on uh, the energy disclosure ordinance um, coming up this coming Tuesday uh, at six o'clock here in this room. Um, it's going to be a little background history, and then uh, talking about uh, well, actually just like getting people's ideas, feedback, input. Um, for moving forward. And uh, yeah, so there's that. And uh, there's also, we're plan we are planning a transportation um, September 18th. day. Uh, so, yeah, September 18th is a Wednesday um, that we otherwise do not have council. And the idea is we're, we're gonna be having presentations from a variety of transportation related um, uh, organizations, uh, giving us an update on either what they've been up to or um, potential for uh, what they could be doing. And uh, yeah, there's no action items to be taken that day. It's just um, you know, sort of an update. But obviously, everyone is invited, and um, hopefully, that'll be a productive conversation. Um, so, I think that is it for me. Um, we have to be early next week, next meeting. Oh, yeah, we have the picture. We're taking a picture next time. So, I have lost. Uh, uh, yeah, John, do you? Oh, just that I got back from DEF CON, and this time we had Vermont's style voting machines. So we took them apart, and I know them inside and out now, if anybody has any questions. Vermont style voting machines? Yeah, Sweet. the ones that, well, a lot of other states use them too, with those really old funky things, you know, that we used to go into the black boxes um, for the, the ballots go. Yeah, we, we hacked them. We got into them, well, to the extent we could, but we had splayed apart on the table. Oh, sorry. Anyway, it was great fun. I can I can tell you all about not just their vulnerabilities, but what we what our procedures that that mitigate those vulnerabilities are because we are really doing very well. That's great. That's pretty exciting. Uh, I think. Uh, oh, I have one thing. Um, first of all, a couple things. First of all, I, I would like to thank our police department for um, their efforts with the protest. And certainly my heart goes out to the family of Mark Johnson and our officers. Nobody wants to be in that situation and their families. Uh, we obviously, as the mayor said, support a full and complete uh, investigation and want the best. We certainly w agree that all public information should be released as soon as it's possible. Uh, I, even on the day of the event, I was speaking for me with Sue and I said, you know, we've got to get information out, the details, as soon as possible so that people to reduce speculation. So, but a horrible situation there and so I, I appreciate um, not that I appreciate that somebody passed away but I appreciate the people that are doing very hard jobs on behalf of all of us and having to make very difficult decisions and I thank them for their service and I would like to introduce Donna Barlow Casey who's sitting there next to um, Sue Donna starting on Monday will be our acting DPW director and by the end of uh, August, our acting assistant city manager. She's going to do double duty. Hopefully, we'll be filling those roles pretty quickly. We'll be talking about that. So we, we're hoping she can at least cover some projects and do all those things. Donna has a long uh, range of experience, including having been a town man manager in Milton. She worked with our DPW for about nine months as an operations manager, ran Central Vermont Solid Waste District for a, quite a while. and. Um, Ian has worked in other, and has a strong background in sustainability and energy issues. So, okay. we're happy to have her back, and happy to have her on board. Super, <laughs> welcome. Uh, now, I've got uh, on the agenda here uh, yes. potential uh, executive session. Do we still want to do that? It shouldn't take too terribly. Okay. Um, so, is there a motion? think there's any other business or anything? The only reason I'm asking, they're just, Stephen is still here, and okay. so I just, on the agenda. 
fair enough. Um, I don't think we have anything left to do. Any further comments? Okay. Um, so uh, we will, if we are going to, into this executive session, we will not be coming out to take any action. So our meeting will uh, effectively be done. Uh, is there a motion to go into executive session? I move pursuant to 1 DSA section 313A3 that we enter executive session to discuss the appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employees. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay.